Before we get started, I want to do a little bit of an announcement. If everything worked out properly, below this video and really all of the videos from here on out, you should see a little segment for merch. I can't believe I'm even saying the, these words. <laughs> so far, we don't have much. Uh, we've got stickers. We got these stickers. I designed these myself. I had somebody redesign them for an enamel pin. Haven't figured that part out yet, but we've got stickers. I just realized you can't even see the t-shirt. We got a t-shirt too, the same design. You got, you got, you got your boy uh, Fox and your boy Peacock over here. And it's funny too, it's like FP, Floppycock. Anyways, so I'm very, very proud of that. I'm not at a point where I'm comfortable accepting support through something like Patreon or uh, Kofi. I just don't have that consistency. I'm not doing this on the reg to the point where I feel like it's justified to ask for support, especially if it's like a something for nothing kind of support. So I wanted to do something where you could still support the channel, but at the, still, at the same time, get something in return. Can you see? I'm really proud of this shirt. <laughs> Did you just see that? That's just cool. I love this, I love this t-shirt. Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, on to the video. Thank you for your patience. Let's get on with it. Chapter 3 is split up into three main acts and an additional final act that is based off of how you perform in the first three main acts. Thus, this final act has three endings, bad, neutral, and good. Neutral has two variations, one negative, one positive. Each of these three acts will take you to three different locations. Within each location, you have the option to do a main quest, to do a secret boss battle, or you can just get back into your car and skip to the next act without doing anything. To put it briefly, doing the bare minimum gets you the neutral ending, defeating all the secret bosses gets you the good ending, and skipping specifically on the third act will get you the bad ending. Being that this is the final installment of our faith analysis. I think it's best that we start with the shortest playthrough first, the bad ending, and finish off with the full good ending playthrough. I honestly rather we just get the bad ending out of the way first so that we can end this final installment off with a good note. Speaking of notes, there are two notes exclusive to the bad playthrough. So during this first bad playthrough, I'm going to skip all the notes that we would otherwise get in our main playthrough. Um, I'm going to skip all the cutscenes. I'm going to skip everything. Everything that is exclusive to the bad ending, we will go over. And don't worry, if you feel like we're skipping something that's important, we will go over everything in our main full good playthrough. Right now, we're just doing the bad playthrough just to get all the, the, the extra stuff out of the way first. And I think it'll also help really understanding the main plot of faith. Trust me, there is a method to my madness. So without further ado, let's see what would happen if Father Ward didn't back his already dwindling faith with works. We start with a flashback dream, but we will go over this in our good playthrough. Let's just focus on notes, player actions, and cutscenes exclusive to the bad ending. However, that being said, I want to point out this instance where a possessed Amy is depicted with white eyes. This will come into play with a theory I have regarding the bad ending. We wake up from the flashback dream. It's October 28th, three days before the profane Sabbath. We will come to find out that the profane Sabbath is basically the end of the world that's supposed to happen on Halloween. This is the end game of the cult of the second death. We start the first act lumbering through Father Ward's house. Passing through his hallway, he again notes he doesn't want to go in that strange room with the crosses on it. We go into the kitchen to find that we can go into the basement. But right now, there's nothing there. We pick up our first assignment to investigate the clinic that Amy worked at. We get out of our car, and the idea of investigating this clinic fills us with dread. Our brain shoots off signals for our feet to move, but the blood in our legs feels ten times heavier. We shuffle our feet back around and head back home. We see an image flash on screen of what looks to be a bloodied medical undercroft, perhaps underneath the clinic that we are fleeing from. We will be keeping this bloody undercroft in mind for our canon, please, playthrough. We wake up from another flashback dream. It's now October 29, two days before the profane Sabbath. We're getting letters from our childhood friend Lisa now, in addition to Father Garcia. 
Great, An another person for us to let down. But both are pointing in the direction of the New Haven apartment building. So we head there. We arrive to the New Haven apartment building. Our childhood friend is in there and something tells me they're in trouble. The kindred pull of a friend in need is almost pulling my heart out of my chest. I hope for my feet to follow, but they don't. She'll be fine. I only make things worse anyways, just like I did with Amy. Driving away, we see another image, a crusty elevator, likely the elevator that services the tenants of the New Haven apartment building. If there's one good thing about the bad playthrough is that we don't have to deal with that fucking elevator. Alas, we will be keeping this busted, dusty, disgusty ass elevator in mind for our good playthrough. We wake up from yet another flashback dream. It's October 30th, one more day until the profane Sabbath. Keep your pants on, we're gonna go over everything. Okay, you want some information about these dreams? Fine, I'll give you something. For the first time, we see a different version of Amy's overworld sprite. It has two beady white glowing eyes, very similar to that first flashback dream. She doesn't have the face mutilation yet. So, the way I see it is, white eyes signifies the possession she was going through within her first exorcism, and that mutilation had to have taken place sometime after she escaped the psychiatric ward and before Father Ward meets her for a second time in chapter one. Our next, our next assignment, something about a daycare. Not kids, man. Look, like, I've gone through enough as it is. I can't, not, not the kids, man. I, I just, I can't handle that right now. We head there just to check it out. And it looks like a cop drives by us. So yeah, I think they got it taken care of. So we head back home. On our way home, we see this gross, bloody red corridor with a painting of Sister Miriam? That, that's in the daycare? What did I just drive away from? We will be keeping this daycare and what lies underneath it in mind for our good playthrough. We wake up from yet another flashback dream and here we are, Halloween 1987, the day of the profane Sabbath. The cross hanging above our bed is turned upside down. And it's even that way in the waking up cutscene, which is pretty neat. I didn't notice that. We walk to the door with the crosses on it. Father Ward says something different this time. He says, I need to check inside one last time. The key is in the basement. We also see a silhouette of a woman walking past our window. Something's not right. We enter the main living room and we hear knocking at the door. We slowly approach the peephole to see Thralls, we gotta get out of here. The thralls break in through the window and their heads are wavering in a way I've never seen before. And wait, pressing the space bar does nothing. We have lost our ability to use our cross. The only place to go now is up into the kitchen and to the basement. There is a key there and we didn't see it before. So we pick it up and we stay quiet. I don't even know if using the pillars to hide even helps, but we evade the centipede demon. Interesting fact, if we were to go back into the basement, the centipede demon wouldn't be there anymore. Not sure if this is just that video game despawn stuff, or if this is supposed to signify that the centipede is sort of a part of Father Ward's imagination or psyche or whatever, but honestly, you could say that literally about everything in this game. So it's really just whatever side of the fence you land on. Our backyard door is open. Those thralls, they must have made their way into our backyard. So we peek outside to see what's going on. They've created this star-shaped hole. The one that the peekaboo demon climbed into in chapter two. Our nightmares are becoming reality. What the hell are these people doing in my house? Did that centipede demon crawl out of that? Or are they preparing my home for the arrival of the peekaboo demon? With the thralls away from the front door, we go outside to see the state of the neighborhood. They've lit Father Ward's car on fire. What kind of bedlam did these thralls and cultists lay in their path on their way over to our home? We check the house on our right. In the window, we see a child screaming and what seems to be corpse parts and blood in his bedroom. The TV is out of service. These freaks must have attacked the infrastructure and communication. And now that I even look at it, it seems that the white glowing eyes in the child's eyes, maybe that signifies possession. Did the child, through demonic possession, kill these people, hurt his family? We walk back into our house, over to the hallway, and unlock the door covered in crosses to find Amy. 
Her eyes are black or empty, or, but they're not... That mutilation, it's gone. It's not there anymore. It's Amy. It goes without saying, this is taking place after chapter one, after the first exorcism of Amy Martin. She doesn't have the mutilation on her face anymore. She doesn't even have the white glowing eyes. Keep this in mind for when we summarize the bad ending. <laughs> what am I doing? <laughs> Amateur hour over here. Where is it? Is this purple? I legit can't tell, bro. It's so, it's gotten so bad. Um. Oh, that's blue. That's blue right there. This is purple. That's kind of busted. Okay. Keep these different phases of Amy's face in mind for when we summarize the bad ending. We pick up note 43. It's an intake form for new patients at the Yale Psychiatric Institute. The intake was filled the night of the failed exorcism of Amy. The intake mentions a childhood knee injury and dormant asthma, likely explaining why Father Ward walks so slow. On the night of Amy Martin's exorcism, he suffered minor cuts, bruises, and a sprain to his left ankle. But he arrived in a state of psychological shock. This is something I feel we tend to gloss over when talking about this game. The profound level of trauma that Father Ward has undergone. You are going to see when we do the main playthrough, in the flashback dreams of that fateful night of Amy's exorcism, how scared Father Ward was, how desperate, alone, and trapped he was. In a way, this fear, this desolation, this desperation has never left him. He never got better. That letter that he wrote to the Psychiatric Institute, that was insincere. This fissure that lies across Father Ward's psyche is the primary opening that the unspeakable has came through to put constant pressure on Father Ward's mind, body, spirit, and soul. And you know what I think? I think the reason why Father Ward has been bearing such an unfathomably cruel cross this entire game is because secretly, truly, I think the unspeakable sees how powerful he is, how dangerous he could be to the unspeakable. And what we've seen in this bad ending is the unspeakable's triumph over Father Ward. No, actually, it's Father Ward's triumph over Father Ward, in a way. Approaching Amy leads to this cutscene. What you say, what's wrong, me? Why are you tormenting me like this? I don't know how you ended up here. I just... I forgive them. This forest... This... This is the forest off of Snake Meadow Lane. Amy? That... That's the creature I saw when I saw Amy again. What's it doing here? Everything changed the moment I stepped inside this house. The Martins didn't deserve this. It should have been me. There is the entrance to the abyss. I met the devil in this very room. You should have had a normal childhood. I should have saved you. I wonder if she's still up there, waiting for me. Why did I come up here? Why couldn't I just leave and never come back? We wandered through an even more desiccated version of the Martin household. Our failure has eroded away its memories, its essence. I almost miss the haunted, horrific version of this home from chapter one, because at least there, there was time. There was, there was faith left in us. We pick up note 44. Bob, I wouldn't be breaking Klein confidentiality like this if we didn't go way back. The situation is really starting to worry me. Cindy's delusions are much worse than she initially let on. I was careful to gradually introduce the reality of the situation. To you were very patient with how she still spoke about the fake birthday parties, etc. I thought we were making progress when I got her to accept that she miscarried and that the twins are gone. But she now seems convinced they are trying to make contact with her 
and that she can find replacements for their spirits to inhabit. Does that sound familiar? Remember the house we found in that village in Nicaragua? Did you tell her about it? I don't know why you would, but I can't think of any other reason for why she'd be talking about things like that. Come to my office as soon as you can. We need to talk about what to do next. Morris. The twins. They were dead all this time. The twins room. We haven't checked the twins room yet. There is a whole lot to unpack here. Demnatio Memoriae translates to condemnation of memory. It is a punishment in history where not only is somebody executed or killed, but their very existence is stricken from the record. The idea that death is not of the body, but of your memory is something that permeates so much of human history. The Aztecs had this belief. Uh, the Romans are the ones that coined Damnatio Memoriae. Uh, and even you could even interpret Joseph Stalin's uh, smudging of people from photos a form of damnatio memori. That being said, the condemnation that Father Ward receives is far beyond a worldly kind of condemnation. It goes beyond just redacting documents and smudging and photoshopping photos. No, his very existence, every single person, thing, place he's touched, has had some sort of influence on, is stricken from existence, uncreated, if you will. Think back to what Amy said to him, unforgivable. Think back to how she looked. This would have been the first time we've seen her without her glowing white eyes or second death wound. With the start of the profane Sabbath, we were not there to save her, so she was likely executed or discarded uh, by the cult, and we're being confronted by her ghost, her vengeful spirit. Gosh, think about what we did to Michael. I'm sure that kid has a bone to pick with us after the way we treated him in chapter one, self-defense situation or not. And the twins, sure, they died in the womb, but I'm of the belief that they, beyond the grave, have been leading us to save Amy. From the beginning, they have been interceding for a sister that they never even met. And all we had to do was follow them. And here we kneel in judgment. Father Ward, defined by his drive and need to save children, save the vulnerable. And now he is, in the bad ending, 
being condemned to this truly existential punishment by the very children he failed to save, Amy, Nathan, Jason, and Michael. Now, this is conjecture, but I don't think this ending has really anything to do with the unspeakable. What I mean is, I mean, the profane Sabbath has a lot to do with the unspeakable, obviously, but the damnatio memori, I don't think is the doing of the unspeakable. I could be wrong. The unspeakable wouldn't consider Father Ward's failure to be unforgivable. The unspeakable has no reason to punish Father Ward for doing the very thing that he wanted Father Ward to do, especially now that the profane Sabbath is at hand. The thralls, the centipede demon, they don't damnatio memori us, they mortis us, they kill us. None of them take us to the damnatio memori ending. The only person that takes us to the damnatio memori ending is Amy. I think this is Amy alongside all the other young victims of this unholy epic, punishing us for our inaction. The four children are so angry with Father Ward, they are willing to even allow themselves to be damnatio memoried as a consequence of his punishment. Because after all, every single one of these entities, these souls have been touched by Father Ward's story. To be so angry at someone, so frustrated, that you're willing to just uncreate yourself so that they get uncreated as punishment. I can understand that anger. All we had to do was follow the twins, follow Amy. This is a bad ending, but in a effed up way, it's somehow a just ending, a just punishment at least. Don't worry, we'll be using all of this information we've collected in the bad ending in our analysis of the good ending. And so let's start the true good ending of Faith Chapter 3. Ah, ah. Took you long enough. So that's what being uncreated feels like. You think you can handle this? Yeah, it just tastes like cream corn. What? One of the things I forgot to mention in the previous videos is the changing of Father Ward's crucifix material. In the first chapter, it's a resplendent yellow, likely gold. In the second, it's a silvery white. And in the third chapter, it's either bronze or wooden. It's hard to tell. It could also be brass, so we'll be keeping these various materials of the crucifixes in mind for a small theory I have regarding Act 2, the apartment. This is likely to symbolize Father Ward's dwindling faith, its shimmer fading as the unspeakable gnaws at his psyche every time he goes to bed. We start off with a flashback dream. It's September 21st, 1986, the day of Amy's failed exorcism, and a year before the events of Chapter 1 were in the car, riding passenger to Father Allred. Based on this conversation, we learn that this is Father Ward's first exorcism ever, and that Father Allred has been corresponding with the Martin family. It seems the situation has developed to the point where he warns Father Ward that they'll be in it for a long night, and to follow his exact word to the letter. Okay, I pull up, and we see the front door open to Father Allred's warm smile and Father Ward's unbroken angst. Father Allred and Bob Martin share some words. This is the first time we're seeing the overworld sprites of the Martin parents, so we'll be keeping their appearance in mind. We walk up to the fridge to see a drawing. Now we know what the drawing in the house actually is from what we see in chapter one. Ooh, by the way, do you remember how that drawing on the refrigerator in chapter one was signed by Nate? Well, now that we know that Nate is dead, the drawing must have been done by Cindy, the mother. So the implication here is interesting. The drawing is of a robed person being attacked by this black demon. So on, so on a subconscious level, she's aware of these red-robed cultists and even demonic activity. So let's keep that chapter one drawing in mind for our final rundown of the Martin family. This drawing, however, is signed by Amy Martin. It depicts the Snake Meadow Church with two stick dolls and four X's, one of them being slightly separate from the others. I believe Amy left us this drawing in our dreams. It's crazy how stuff doesn't click the first time you see it, but don't worry, this will make a lot of sense very soon. I'm going to point out that there are four X's and two stick dolls, adding up to six, six of the children that were kidnapped by Sister Miriam. I think the X's symbolize death. Maybe four orphans that were killed. So something else must have happened to two of these orphans. So, we will be keeping this chapter 3 dream drawing in mind. 
I believe this drawing is Amy from outside the dream world trying to communicate with Father Ward. This won't be the last time we see her giving us hints. Bob lets Father Allred know that Amy is in the basement and she had to be restrained. Father Allred says he understands and not to worry for God's servants are here. Bob simply replies with, if you say so. We walk through the basement and get a flashback inside our flashback. We walk towards chapter one, Amy, then we're brought back to the basement. I'm not sure what Erdorf did, but Father Allred's computerized voice sounds so sweet and convivial, at least until he tells the demon to look at him in Latin. <laughs> We wake up from our dream and it's October 20 f you in the air. We wake up from our dream. It's October 28th, 1987, just a bit more than a month after the events of chapter 1 and 3 days before the profane Sabbath. We pick up note 2, a letter from Father Garcia, identical to the one we get at the end of the good ending of chapter 2. To reiterate, Father Garcia is warning us about the profane Sabbath and that we need to find Nate and Jason. It is odd that Father Garcia knows about the twins now that we know that they're dead. Father Ward passes by the cross-laden door and says, I'm not going in there, and we can rest assured that we won't be going in there this playthrough. We pick up a note in the kitchen. Note 3 is essentially the game telling us that we will need to discern lies from truths and we must use the notes we have to scrutinize information. As far as I know, this comes into play in the second act, and even then the lie is very obvious. There will be one instance though where the color of a note will change if you look at it in the menu, revealing its author in Act 3. We pick up Note 4, our first assignment from Father Garcia. He laments that he can't find the twins in the foster care system. We obviously know why that is, but Father Garcia thinks they may be living with a relative. While he investigates that lead, he wants us to investigate the clinic that Amy worked at. Before leaving, we check on our neighbors. The child in the house to our right is peacefully watching television, and the family to our left is doing the same. Oh, I put Act 1, the apartments. I'm bad. Remember, we want to get the good ending, so the secret to the clinic has something to do with this bloody undercroft that lies underneath it. We got a long drive, so in the meantime, let me fill you in on a detail I missed in both Chapter 1 and Chapter 2. Many of you probably know that in Chapter 1, if you keep going right on Snake Meadow Lane, you come to find the gray man hiding behind a tree, and approaching him causes him to drop a red clown nose, labeled as Nasus, or nose in Latin, in our inventory. Well, you might not know that in Chapter 2, in that intro where we briefly play as Father Garcia, after Michael escapes his restraints, if you go back to his bedroom, you'll notice his closet is open, and that same red clown nose is hidden behind the closet door. After collecting it, walking back around the bed causes this cross above the bed to fall. We got a clinic to scour, so in the meantime, we'll be keeping this clown nose in mind for our final breakthrough of Father Garcia's character. We arrive to a truly sketchy part of town. A cop stands in guard of the clinic. We investigate the right to see a dead bird. Oh, hey, look! I recognize two of those three graffitis, the I'm Scared monster and W.D. Gaster an enigmatic character from Undertale who accidentally Damnasio memoriaed himself. We investigate to find out, yes, the bird is dead. We walk away and it twitches its head. Maybe it's still alive. Nope, the dead is bird. Anyways, we, whoa! A thrall stands in our way. But oddly enough, we don't even need to exercise him. He just runs away in shame as we approach him. We will make a callback to this scene in Act 3, so we'll be keeping this blue bird in mind. Another thing to point out, check out that SUV with a red character inside of it. Could be a thrall or a cultist, but it looks a lot like that SUV that tails us at the end of the bittersweet ending in Chapter 2. We interact with the cop. <laughs> Breacher. <laughs> I don't know why, his voice I think is the funniest to me in the game. 
We look at a poster for a heavy metal festival called Bielzefest, and a lineup of the different bands. This band lineup looks a lot like it would be a, a very cryptic set of instructions on how to get the secret boss. One interesting thing is that the event is to take place this Friday night. If it was happening that week, then that would place it on October 30th, the day, or I should say night, before the profane Sabbath, starting at 10 p.m., but going over into 2 a.m. on the day of the profane Sabbath. Perhaps this 2 a.m. motif we kept seeing throughout this game is foreshadowing the time of the profane Sabbath's beginning, maybe a sort of second death witching hour of sorts. A lot of heavy stuff happens in these clinics, not just abortions, but bad news regarding fertility and uh, pregnancy complications and stuff like that. And it just seems so tasteless to just have this poster <laughs> in front of the clinic. Like imagine just a couple walking out of the clinic, consoling each other, and they just look at the poster and look at each other and it's like, you wanna go to Warp Tour? You feel watched. <laughs> yeah, I do. We make our way through the clinic and it's been boarded up. It's defunct. Perhaps it was shut down. We pick up note six. Note six, reading to Rhonda Erickson from Gary Miller. Hi, Rhonda. Just a couple of reminders after last week's visit. Please keep your desk tidy. Our patients need to feel at ease with their health care experience. Remember, our sales points, clean, quick, and courteous. Do not return any calls from the Department of Health before notifying me first or leaving a message with Tiffany. We cannot afford another surprise investigation. Please do not call me on my direct personal line if you happen to hear back from Miss Martin. Oh, what? I, I, oh, that's pretty... Oh, that's crazy. I didn't even realize that. One more thing. Keep Jeffrey out of sight. Remember, Gary loves you. And the facts. Now, we will be meeting this Jeffrey soon. However, for Act 2, the apartments, we will be keeping this Tiffany in mind. I have to wonder, when he refers to Miss Martin, is he referring to Cindy Martin or Amy Martin? Cindy Martin would be referred to as Mrs. Martin, not Miss Martin, because she's married to Bob. So if he's referring to Amy Martin, at what point was this fax created? Was this before Amy had her second death? Was this after? Was this even before the first exorcism? It's kind of interesting. So Gary fears another health inspection. What we're about to see tells us that they likely wouldn't pass even a first health inspection. So one must wonder what lengths they went through to avoid getting written up or shut down the first time around. Also, the note mentions a Jeffrey. Going down deeper into the clinic, we exercise an IV stand to get note seven. It's a note made by one of the clinic associates informing themselves that pills do not dissolve well into the IV bag contents. This clinic is doping up their patients and it seems they're trying to induce hallucinations without their knowledge. Now this is very interesting. I don't want to jump the gun too hard, but I'm of the mind that this is a sneak peek into the second death's cult thrallification process. When the thrall charges at you, they say, I know not what I do, and we are many. And when cleansed, they say, bless you, child, and I had no choice. This makes a lot of sense as to why they're called thralls in the first place. No duh, they are not in the cult out of choice. That's why they're called thralls, but they're in the cult out of chemical enslavement and demonic, pup demonic? demonic puppeteering. In the entirety of all of chapter three, the only thralls that lead to death are those with the squiggly heads. You can't even ward them off with your cross. I would say these are subjects that have finally succumbed to the full thrall form and under constant hallucination. So then I have to say that maybe the characters we meet in the safe family tomb in chapter two aren't thralls, at least not in tra the traditional sense, but simply non-enthralled cultists. Regardless, we will be keeping this hallucinogenic drug in mind. Deeper into the clinic, we see three sonograms. As much as I want to say that the second sonogram looks kind of like a lizard, and the third sonogram looks very creepy, I honestly don't know what to be looking for when it comes to these images. I can't tell if I'm supposed to be seeing a fetus transform into something, or I don't know. Perhaps as we press on, we'll get some sort of clarification. I'm not sure what these sonograms are supposed to be telling us, but we'll be keeping this cult's fixation on things neonatal in mind. 
We noticed the boarded up door, so we entered the next room towards the left and pick up a crowbar. We also noticed two faint red symbols on the wall, an oval with lines and a triangle pointing down. Hmm. So aside from that bloody Undercroft vision, this symbol must be another hint as to how to access the secret of the clinic. We walk over to the boarded up- ah, ah! What the hell is that? Is that Jeffrey? Jeffrey straps us to a gurney and takes us to an operating room. He leaves us there for a moment, giving us a chance to hide. In the meantime, let me show you what it looks like if you try to take the crowbar past the door he grabs you at to the front door. Crafty bastard. He comes back and investigates the partition to the right, so we sneak past him. He roars once more, so we blend in with these other bloody gurneys with corpses still in them. Wait, we're in that bloody undercroft. And there's that oval symbol. This must be where the secret to the clinic is. So we wait for Jeffrey to go back to the operating room. We scoot over to the stairs where the cop from the before gets us and unstraps us from the gurney. What the hell is going out here? You're coming with me. Breacher. <laughs> Breacher. <laughs> we go back upstairs and out of the corner of our eye we see a red mass evade us through a window. That window wasn't broken before. Jeffrey must be outside the clinic, so we have to be vigilant. We approach the door with our crowbar and Jeffrey jumps inside from a window. The only way to kill Jeffrey is to slow him down with our cross while the police officer takes shots at him. I can't imagine how frustrating this boss fight must be for speedrunners, but we eventually kill him and we escape the clinic. We go outside to see the police officer's car on fire, surrounded by thralls. The officer darts after these thralls, and so we follow the officer, only to see his body severely mutilated with his service pistol left on the floor. He reminds me a lot of us. When we die, our cross is left on the floor. And look, he's taken the place of that sacrificed bird. This dark blue cop being killed in the same spot that the bird was killed will be an interesting connection we can make in Act 3, The Daycare. We make our way back into the bloody Undercroft. Some bloody words formed into the bottom right saying, join us. So we keep slamming our pixelized body into the gurney until we can get back on it. We scoot over to the corpses once more, knowing that we are safe from Jeffrey. Sitting there for a minute, the door opens. We walk, or I should say scoot, to the door, and we see a cutscene. These dark, gray, undead rise from the gurneys, do an interpretive dance, and push us down the stairs. Sorry, I missed that. One more time. <laughs> One more time for posterity. <laughs> okay, okay, that is probably the funniest, <laughs> the funniest quote, I guess, of the game. Ah! We are in the hidden area underneath the clinic. What lies ahead will be the first of three secret boss fights that we must fight to get the good ending. We enter a room with candles. There's that upside down triangle again, and it's flanked by two of these leviathan cross symbols on either side. Ahead of us is an orange woman. We begin to exercise the orange woman and- What the hell? 
we are swarmed by babies, undead, <coughs> undead babies, possessed babies, demon babies. I don't know. I have not a clue. But I'm taking this mother of the unholy down. This fight is not as difficult as it initially seems. You can keep exercising the woman. The babies don't kill you instantly, but they can slow you down and be harmful if fully swarming you. So manage the swarm while still pulling out damage against the orange woman. Eventually the babies will shield, form a shield around the mother. And I'm not sure if this makes her immune to damage, but keep your cross on her because she will start spawning babies with glowing eyes. They'll initially spawn around her. And your, your cross is sort of like an AOE, a conical AOE. Exercise those demon babies before they get under the window or else they'll transform from the light into something a lot more faster and dangerous. But eventually you will beat her. Thus ends the first secret boss fight of chapter three. But we will be keeping this orange mother for a connection we're gonna make in act three, the daycare. So, so far we have a blue cop in association with a bird and an orange mother. Triumphant but ever vigilant, we leave the boss fight room and we pick up note eight, a note from that bastard Gary. Note eight. Smooth moves, priest, but the twins are not here. Carry out the works of your God while there's yet day. For the night cometh. Remember, Gary loves you. We drive home, and on our drive, we see a vision of the first part of a seal disappearing. This is the seal that bars us from the good ending. So one down, two more to go. We go back home, triumphant for now, but ever militant, ending our day. Act one, the clinic didn't give us too much of a mess to clean up info-wise, but let's ponder nonetheless. Jeffrey couldn't be exercised. The only way to defeat Jeffrey is through ballistic damage from the cop's firearm. So I have to ask, is he a human or is he a demon? Every demon we face so far can be fought with our crucifix. In this case, it's only slowed down by the, the crucifix. So I have to ask, is he a demon or a severely maligned and mutated human? At first I thought maybe Jeffrey was the health inspector from the first health inspection. However, based on the sonograms that we saw in the clinic, I think that these are the developmental cycles of Jeffrey. I'm of the belief that Jeffrey is a mutated baby. Sorry, a, a baby that was mutated and birthed to create this monstrosity. Almost kind of Rosemary's Baby style. How about those gray patients, those gray forms that attack us before we meet the orange mother? Are they demons? Are they the undead humans? We don't really get too much of an answer. I think they're just sort of there to keep us on our toes. And what about this purpose of the clinic? The neonatal theme is evident, but what do they do with the babies? What happens to the babies? Are they killed, sacrificed? Are they kidnapped for other purposes? Or are they transformed like I think they were in the case of Jeffrey? Or are they all three? Another peripheral thing I want to ask, the orange mother, what is her true identity? Is she Rhonda, as mentioned in the first note we collect in the clinic? Or is she the smiling lady? Because I noticed her teeth, he has a very wide smile, and she's associated with the clinic. The smiling lady in chapter two, the woman thrall, her story is heavily associated with the clinic. She meets a smiling lady that's associated with that clinic, and she, she's very, very foreboding. She met Gary through that smiling lady. So, you know, who, what is the identity of this orange mother? We also get a pretty cool picture regarding the thrallification process. An unindoctrinated person is given hallucinogenic drugs, but those drugs are not enough to fully thrallify them. That's why that one thrall doesn't attack us in that alleyway. He just runs off and says, I know not what I do. If you take a, season, a, a marinated thrall, you know, neo thrall, and you give it some more hallucinogenic injections and some pills, plus indoctrination, that's when you get the full-blown hostile thrall. The ones that we see in the bad ending and we'll see later on in chapter three with the squiggly faces that say chaos reigns when they kill you. This act serves uh, the purpose of tying a nice bow around a lot of the questions players since chapter one had regarding the purpose of the clinic. So going into chapter three, keep in mind, what is the cult's purpose of these babies? The significance of the orange mother what is the purpose and effect of these hallucinogenic drugs? And this is my little zhuzh, the significance of the bird being killed, and then in that bird's place, a dark blue cop being killed as well. 
And so concludes Act 1. It feels nice to finally erase one of these whiteboards. I know some of you really like the erasing of the whiteboards, and sadly I didn't think ahead when doing the whiteboard segments, so I don't have a lot of footage of me erasing the whiteboard, so please enjoy this particular segment of me erasing the whiteboard. We enter another flashback dream. A possessed Amy is laughing at Father Allred while he exercises her. Father Allred implores that we use the book to recite the rite of exorcism. Translated to English, we say, I exercise you, creature of the salt. I adjure you, cursed devil. I adjure you, serpent, to depart from this virgin. I exercise you by the living God, you phantom. In the name of Jesus, who is to come to judge the living and the dead, but before we can finish with the sign of the cross, the parents run in and disturb the rite. Hmm, quite the timing here. Let's remember this for when we do our final appraisal of Cindy. Amy screams for her mother. Father Allred tells us to get the parents out of there because this distressing image will afflict the parents, making the demon all the more powerful. Father Ward escorts them to the kitchen. He says it's best that they stay there. Bob states that he doesn't know what that thing is, but it isn't his daughter. If you stay, Father Ward says, I don't know what to tell you, just stay here and pray for Amy. We find Father Allred dead or incapacitated with writing in his blood. Take it, save her. We pick up his cross, then pick up our figurative cross when we say, don't worry, Amy, I'm coming. But then that danger motif gets louder as if something is approaching us. We wake up from our dream. It's now October 29th, 1987, two days before the profane Sabbath. We pick up note 10. It's a letter from Lisa, our childhood friend. She tells us her situation has gotten worse and for us to come and help her. She lives at New Haven Apartment Complex in apartment 5A. She says if she doesn't answer to get her spare key from one of her neighbors. Tiffany. This is that same Tiffany associated with the clinic. Lisa is in deep far more than she realizes. Tiffany will be the central character of Act 2, so let's still keep her in mind. We pick up note 11, another letter from Lisa, and it's obvious our dear kindred is in the belly of the beast and even now she's aware of it. She advises us to ignore Tiffany, that none of the residents can be trusted. We definitely should heed our call. And luckily, note 9 from Father Garcia tells us to go to the same place. Save Lisa and defeat Malthus. Two birds, one apartment. Before we go, we check in on our neighbor's television and it looks like they're watching wrestling. Nothing too weird just yet. We get in our car and head off. It's another long drive, so in the meantime, let me fill you in on another thing I missed, and this one is important. If you remember in the basement in Chapter 1 and the room before Sister Miriam's boss fight in Chapter 2, there is this bloody scene with demonic symbols. For some odd reason, I interpret the Chapter 1 instance of this as the brutal remains of Amy's exorcism, and the Chapter 2 instance of this as just a sort of callback to the Chapter 1 instance. It turns out I was totally wrong. Since note 19 in chapter 1 describes the second death ritual, albeit in redacted detail, I still feel justified in letting you know what that scene in chapter 1 and chapter 2 mean. They are the aftermath of the second death ritual. And while it's obvious that in chapter 1 it's the aftermath of Amy's ritual because it's in her house and her face has been carved up, one of the non-redacted instructions of note 19, I'm going to jump the gun here and tell you that the aftermath of the second death in chapter 2 was for a different character. Now I've said enough, but now you know that this equals second death ritual. Okay, I pull up and then enter the New Haven Apartments. We head in, then left, to find note 12. It's a dubious letter left by somebody trying to pose as Lisa. Father Ward suggests we check the other notes, but yeah, it's pretty obvious this letter is BS. It's fiction. It's false. It's totally made up. This one was invented by a writer. We take a gander at the mailboxes to confirm that Lisa lives in 5A, and T. Robinson lives in 3B, and a T. Boone lives in 8A. We don't know Tiffany's last name, so we will check these two rooms. Instead of taking the elevator, we will take the stairs, investigating each room. Since each floor only has two rooms, this won't be as cumbersome of an investigation as it might initially seem. We make our way to the stairs. 1B is closed and there is a broken mirror near it. 2B is closed, but 2A is open. But before we go into 2A, I, out of curiosity, I check the elevator, and I remember 
The elevator is somehow linked to the apartment complex's secret. I break myself from this distraction and go to room 2A. We see a dagger, a ceremonial dagger in the style of that Indonesian Chris knife. We find note 16, written in a pink color we haven't seen before. The author recounts the second death ritual to us and calls Amy a whore. Seems this author is jealous of Amy. Jealous that she's Gary's new favorite for the second death ritual. Weird. But we will come to find out that this was written by Tiffany. So that pink color, that's Tiffany writing. Also note, there is a hidden staircase underneath a table with bloody scuff marks leading to it. We will get access to this area later. On the third floor, 3A is locked. So we approach 3B, the apartment that belongs to T. Robinson. Looks like we got a match. The key must be the spare key to Lisa's room. And there's a trail of blood leading to a locked door and a TV with static displayed. We quickly grab the key and on our way out, we see what looks like Amy on the TV screen. But hold on, it's a tad bit lighter than Amy's purple. Now that I get a better look, she looks pink, much like the pink text that was on the note we read in 2A. Is this Tiffany? She has that second death facial mutilation, but she was lamenting that she wasn't chosen by Gary for the ritual. We will be keeping Tiffany's possible second death in mind. There's nothing but locked doors on the fourth floor, so we head to the fifth floor. We approach apartment 5A, Lisa's apartment. There's an upside down cross in front of it. This doesn't bode well. We enter the room and see a door magically sealed. We exercise the seal to cryptically reveal our next steps. It looks like the seal is associated with a dagger and a mask. We saw a dagger, but we have yet to see a mask. We go into Lisa's bathroom and pick up another key and note 13. The note contains instructions for breaking the seal of Alu. <sighs> Another demon to face? Oh boy. We will be keeping this Alu in mind. Ooh, Alu, you know what sounds good right now? Mmm, Alu Samosas. We confirm what we've already surmised. The dagger and mask are our key through this seal, but we do get a new hint. To ascend to the highest point, then descend to the lowest depths. So we continue making our way up the apartments to collect all notes. We make our way towards 5B to pick up a vague hint as to how to start a game. Hmm. We pick this up in front of an elevator and the first step is to go to the first floor. Being that we know that the secret to the apartment is somehow linked to the elevator, it looks like we have to play some sort of version of the elevator game. I don't remember what the point of the elevator game is, just that there's a lady that can appear and you don't want to talk to her. <laughs> we will be keeping this elevator game in mind for our stay at the New Haven Apartments. With 5B locked, we head to floor 6. 6B is locked, but we find a note in front of the... Uh, oh! Elevator friend? This is note 17, a drawn picture of this fleshy elevator friend with one large eye and a creepy triangular smile. Next to him, seven dots, and the first four floors of the elevator game are written in the bottom right. The drawing is signed by Timmy. Ah! We will be keeping this Timmy and his elevator friend in mind. 6A is also locked, but we can exercise this mirror revealing note 25. This note is an account from a tenant. They mention weird neighbors that are always bringing food to them and making them sick. At first, they like the ubiquity of mirrors around the whole complex, but notes that their reflection seems off to them. One day, they get back home from work and all the mirrors are shattered. We try going up the stairs to get to floor seven, but it looks like it ends here. The writing on the wall says there is no seventh floor. That's strange. I could have sworn there was 10 floors in this building. We check the elevator and there is a seventh floor. So we press the button, but it doesn't work. We keep pressing it and pressing it. <laughs> Suddenly we see a glimpse of the elevator friend. Ugh. In hopes we don't do any more damage to our already precarious situation, we go to floor eight. We enter apartment 8A, the apartment of T. Boone. This isn't Tiffany Robinson, so I wonder if this is just a Mortal Kombat reference. We pick up note 15. It's written by either Gary or a cultist. It's hard to tell because it doesn't end with the Gary loves you signature. It notes that Tiffany has strayed from the cult's path. 
If the face mutilation we saw on the TV is any indication, she likely did the second death on herself without the cult's okay. The note says to proceed with the original plan and make the woman in 5K their vessel. Lisa! They want to do the second death to Lisa! We leave 8A to see the elevator friend hiding on the ceiling. Warding him off is simple enough, but you gotta be careful because he doesn't always do his heavy breathing indicator or show himself hiding. Just Also, just point your cross in his direction. Don't try and position yourself like I did here. <clears throat> Damn it! More of this. Oh, that's so frustrating. All those notes. Ouch. We make our way back to where we left off, where we got mortised, and pick up note 19. Those who keep knocking on forbidden doors will be visited by the one who guards them. This note is a hint as to how to spawn the elevator friend. You keep pressing floor seven, which is knocking on a forbidden door, and you spawn the elevator friend, the one who guards the forbidden door. We see if we can access floor seven by descending from floor eight, but no luck. What's interesting is that the writing on this side says that there is a seventh floor. Now check out this occurrence of the elevator friend hiding in one of the apartments. It's pretty cool. Even though most, if not all of your instances of fighting him will be in linear hallways, it's cool that Airdorf gave him pathfinding for these rare occurrences. We make our way to floor nine, 9A is locked, and we finally defeat the elevator demon, dropping note 18, a drawing titled, Time to play the elevator game. The elevator friend is definitely made of flesh, judging by this pool of blood around his feet in this drawn picture. It looks like he's been reunited with his friend, Timmy. We also now have the second half of the elevator game floors, but we won't bother with that until after we save Lisa. We find a jack-o'-lantern. Exercising it makes it flash, giving me flashbacks to Halloween 3, Season of the Witch, it reveals note 26. Now this is a girthy one. It's an announcement for a Halloween block party that's taking place this Halloween, unaware that it's taking place on the profane Sabbath. Some rules include no anti-religious or satanic imagery, no pranks, no cigarettes or booze, and no overly scary costumes and masks because of an incident where Timmy was traumatized at last Halloween's block party. We are also warned of Timmy's food allergies and asthma. Guests are informed as well about Timmy's new imaginary friend and for people to play along to help Timmy cope. The author also can't wait for the guests to meet Mr. Miller, who has quickly become close to the family and has taken to Timmy very well. A lot of info here. Just so I don't have to keep relay racing back and forth between the acts, I'm just gonna let you know now that Gary's last name is Miller. So the Mr. Miller we're hearing about in this note is Gary. So keep this in mind for when we do our final breakdown of Timmy at the end of Act Two, The Apartments. Also, one thing I wanted to point out, Timmy's allergies reminds me a lot of the, uh, the girl in Hereditary who had allergies. And this isn't the first time I'm gonna make a parallel draw between this, ch this act and Hereditary. We arrive to the top floor and find some writing on the wall. Sacrifice what you cling to. We use our silver key to get into the maintenance room. We pick up note 20, instructions on how to operate the dumbwaiter, which seems to have the purpose of bringing sacrifices to the basement. What's eerie is the final instruction. Do not open the hatch once the dumbwaiter has reached the basement. I don't have enough earplugs and I'm tired of people losing him. So opening the hatch while whatever you sacrificed is being processed, you will hear some sort of deafening noise. We will shortly find out what demon is being given these sacrifices. We check the security cameras of what I believe to be the stairs leading down to the basement. We send our cross down. If we look at the security cameras again, we see a gray form with a red shape on its head. It's the peekaboo demon. It seems to live in this apartment building. And now that it knows we are exposed without our cross, it's ready to hunt. We leave the room and just to the right, three stick dolls block our way. The only place to go is in the elevator. Just to be cheeky, I put in floor seven. The elevator moves, but it goes down to floor four instead. We see a thrall slink away into the darkness. We pick up note 21. It says, Gary lied to us. When you see it, run. 
Remember how the way to evade the peekaboo demon was to stand still in chapter 2? Not this time. We are going to want to run. We see what could be that thrall that we just saw, freshly brutalized by the peekaboo demon. In their blood they wrote, I saw it. We pick up a camera and... Oh boy. Don't worry, this segment is not hard. There's one squirrely part, but honestly it's very simple and straightforward. Since we don't have our cross, pressing spacebar instead flashes the camera, giving us a very temporary view of the things around us. We make our way down to floor 3 and enter 3B, Tiffany's apartment. At some point in this darkness segment, Father Ward will be randomly hallucinating the attic at the Martin household. The door to Tiffany's room is now open. We get jumped by a thrall, but he doesn't kill us. We will come to find out that he stabbed us, non-lethally, with the ceremonial dagger. Notice the little bits of blood dropping from our body. We admire a poster of Priest Cop in her room. Suddenly, Malthus Jumpscare. So that's what he looks like. Hmm, interesting. We meet Malthus for the first time. We'll be getting a better look at him soon, but let's now officially put him on the Team Unspeakable board. There's a board out tunnel in Tiffany's bathroom area. In this tunnel, we see three thralls at an altar to a horned demon. Keep this horned demon in mind, especially the fact that it's hidden in a tunnel behind Tiffany's apartment. Here's what it would look like if you flash the camera in front of them. That, by the way, is the Chaos Reigns cutscene whenever you get killed by a thrall. We enter the next room and flash again. It looks like a star-shaped hole, just like the one from Chapter 2, further confirming that the peekaboo demon walks among us. We make our way down to the second floor and go into room 2A, the room with the knife. We inspect the knife to see it's been bloodied. We find that the table has been moved and we can now go down those stairs. We make our way down the stairs and we flash our camera, revealing the peekaboo demon getting ever closer. We can't move yet, but we heed the words of the dead thrall and get ready to run as soon as possible. We click our flash one more time. It says, mother, in our ear. We start running. We have to be careful with how we time our camera flashes because we don't want to be on cooldown when we enter a new room. We enter the next room. We flash. We do our best to traverse this unholy room of requirement, weaving our way through boxes, using whatever bits of data we can gather during camera flashes. This is a tough segment, and on my first couple playthroughs, it gave me quite a bit of grief. But much like riding a bicycle, it's all downhill from here. Looks like we exit that room and it looks like we're back in the hallway. We just left room 2B. So we'll definitely want to return to floors 2 and 3 to better explore these previously locked rooms. We make our way to the first floor. We go past the entrance and past the mailboxes. We find the basement. Remember the note in Lisa's room. It said that we must descend to the darkness below after having ascended to the top. It looks like the basement is where people wash their clothes, and we see the dumbwaiter too. We follow the blood trail, and look! It's our cross! We pick it up and move one room to the right. Aha! A second death ritual site. This is where Tiffany must have done the second death ritual to herself. We pick up note 22, which confirms that the identity of this pink person writing these pink notes is Tiffany. She's completed the ritual, but she's somewhere beyond. She implores Gary to look for her in the unseen world. The unseen world. That's right. I remember the purpose of the elevator game is to enter another dimension through that sort of portal of the elevator. Let's keep this unseen world in mind. We exercise the already bloodied mask of the second death ritual, breaking one half of the seal of Alu in Lisa's room. Written in blood on both sides of the room, we see not seven and 70 times seven. Not seven, but 70 times seven. This is likely a sort of profane reference to Jesus telling his disciples to not forgive someone seven times, but 70 times seven times. This took me down a rabbit hole because you see, seven times 70 equals 490. And so I started going down a rabbit hole regarding the significance of 490 
in the Bible. There's a model that biblical scholars follow charting Israel's redemptive history. It's done in 490 year long cycles. And then in Hebrew letters, also have numerical values. The word tamim has a numerical value of 490. Tamim means completion. Some also interpret this as the number of perfection. So when Jesus tells his followers to forgive 70 times seven times, some people have interpreted that as in order to live a perfect life, you must be radically forgiving. So anyways, back to the woman who carved her face off. She is saying not seven, maybe not floor seven, but 70 times seven. Is she saying that she has achieved perfection? This sort of profane idea of second death perfection? This is all likely just Tiffany mocking in a profane way Jesus' advice to his disciples. But keep this in mind for some fat flimsy conjecture for when we fight the secret boss of the apartments, because there is this sort of theme of forgiveness there. We enter back into the room where we picked up our cross and see a bunch of unlit candles. And that blood trail leads into a wall. Where have we seen this before? That's right, the peekaboo demon from chapter two. This is our final standoff with the peekaboo demon. We track his movement with how the candles are being lit. This sort of harkens back to the cornfield demon boss fight. Each time we ward off the peekaboo demon, he says something very provocative and personal to Father Ward. Things like, I know your secret. I know your secret. Put out your eyes. You can't hide anymore. You can't hide anymore. Betrayer. Betrayer. She is always with you. She is always with you. And then finally, you belong to her. Remember, anytime we see the peekaboo demon, he says, mother. I believe this is it calling out to Sister Miriam, the mother of demon. In his lines directed towards Father Ward in his final boss fight, he says things like, she will always be you and you belong to her. I believe that this she or her that the peekaboo demon is referring to is Sister Miriam, not Amy. And we'll get into that very soon. Remember, she calls you my little one. Remember this when we piece everything together in Father Ward's Keep in Mind Whiteboard. We walk back up the stairs out of the basement when suddenly this horned demon jumps out of nowhere and attacks us. Notice how the blue in Father Ward's sprite is paler than how it is normally. This signifies when he is under possession. Knowing this, let's run this scene back. We are rushed by a demon we will come to find out is Alu. We can hear Father Ward screaming, ah, but you can also hear that you are mine, priest. Like when we heard it in chapter two, signifying a possession is taking place. The screen goes black and we see Father Ward's eyes opening, but the color on his face is pale. He is now under full possession. We see Malthus staring at us. Then we see Alu through Father Ward, blankly staring back at Malthus. Then we go back to Malthus, then back to Father Ward with his face brutally ripped apart, slightly reminiscent of the mother's lipless and eyeless visage from the clinic. We then see Malthus with a mouth full of blood and his eyes filled with pupils of a possessed Father Ward. Again, notice the pale color. What's interesting is that Father Ward doesn't comment on this. He just goes about his business. I think what we're seeing is something that Father Ward is completely unaware of. This battle for his soul between these two demons happening on an unseen spirit plane, if you will. So that horned demon is Alu. We will come to find out that Alu is actually not related to the machinations of Gary and Malthus. So I'm of the belief that Alu rushed in to possess Father Ward. Then Alu, seeing the spirit world through Father Ward's eyes, finds that Malthus has already called dibs on Father Ward. So Malthus asserts dominance over Alu by biting off Alu's face through the possessed form of Father Ward. 
what commences is this sort of tug of war over Father Ward between these two powerful demons. This is why you kind of see Father Ward drifting back left and right, left and right, when you see him all mangled up. We go to apartment 2A to exercise the bloodied ceremonial knife. The last part of the seal of Alu is lifted. But before we save Lisa, let's pick up some more of our final notes for this act. We walk down the stairs knowing we are safe from the peekaboo demon, and we have our crucifix to exercise any items we find. We enter that hidden storage area and exercise the eye, which serves as an icon or insignia for the second death cult. For some reason, my cross was glitched out and I was exercising it without pressing spacebar. I noticed if you hold space down before a cutscene happens, this glitch will happen. Perhaps a tip for any speedrunners out there. We pick up note 24. Note 24. Brothers and sisters, this month we will be host to a very special visitor. It is here to help prepare the way for the unspeakable. Of course, due to its special nature, it has full access to the entire building, including your apartments, bedrooms, etc. If you are lucky enough to see it, you would do well not to approach it or speak to it. Find a dark or dimly lit area and try to stay out of its way. One of you will be blessed to find it has made its home in your dwelling. Do not go down into the hole it will make, no matter whose voice you hear down there. If you believe one of your fellow brothers or sisters is inside, please notify me and I will retrieve their remains in a timely manner. Also, just a reminder that rent and utilities are due by Friday. Love, Gary. This special visitor is the peekaboo demon. The special nature Gary is referring to is its ability to noclip itself and its victims through walls, making the entire apartment its hunting ground. Gary's advice is to stay still and hide, which doesn't end up working out for the thralls, which is why that note we picked up says Gary lied to us. Gary confirms that the star-shaped hole is in fact its home, and it's made it in one of the rooms of the thralls. We enter 3B, Tiffany's room, and make our way through her bedroom and into that bored out tunnel. The thralls are gone, and we exercise the altar to Alu. We pick up note 23, confirming that Alu is not an intended visitor of Gary's. But nonetheless, you can tell Gary is trying to save face, trying to play off Alu's ceiling of the vessel's door as a test of faith, pondering as it may be of Tiffany's doing. Now this would make sense being that we find the shrine to Alu in the tunnel hidden behind Tiffany's room. Gary implores his followers to take double their pill dosage and to seal themselves in this tunnel with bricks and mortar so that they can ceaselessly pray. How vile. Hey, for real? I hate Gary. We enter the room where the star-shaped hole is and, oh gosh, we see several crops, cropses, corpses of thralls it's hard to tell, but it looks like the peekaboo's demon preferred MO is head crushing. We make our way to 5A, Lisa's room, and enter through the unsealed door. Lisa, dead, got your power on it. Good, what do you so good? It's so good, I can't see through it anymore. I got here as fast as I could. Let's go, Lisa. Lisa, possessed by Alu, walks towards us. We exercise Lisa to repel Alu out of her. Alu will then enter one of these five stick dolls. I don't know how to tell which one it is, so what I do is I exercise the top three. If you guess the right one, Alu will be revealed and will slowly drift towards you, kind of in this sort of glitchy way. Make sure you have ample distance and exercise him. After a small amount of time, Alu will then dart to Lisa and possess her once again. This sequence repeats. However, if you fail to find Alu in the stick dolls in time, he will possess you instead. If you feel you won't be able to find him, then spend that time focusing on making as much distance as possible away from Lisa, because when you get possessed, you can end up killing her, barring you from the good ending. In white text, we see, fight it, John. We will be keeping this white text that says, fight it, John, in mind. You do have a limited influence on John's movements, but don't button that. Just simply press the directional button away from Lisa in sort of a long, drawn out pumping sort of pattern. If you do end up killing Lisa, don't move, just press escape and exit. Reload and it will place you right before the boss fight. We defeat Alu and Lisa runs into her living room. Yeah. <laughs> 
Here's what it would look like if you were to accidentally kill Lisa while possessed. Oh no, Lisa, I'm so sorry. Should never be good. Notice the text of Father Ward being lightly colored. Also, if you do kill Lisa, the fight ends with her death. But luckily, this horrible outcome doesn't apply to us. Also, notice how similar this scene looks to our standoff with Amy. That circular window is reminiscent of the attic window at the Martin house. I think we are slowly helping Father Ward regain his faith, overcoming these trials that so closely resemble his past failures. Walking outside Lisa's apartment, Father Ward gets a hunch that we still have unfinished business here. He senses another demonic seal being broken, somewhere beyond. We take a gander at our notes and chart out the floors we need to visit in the sequence for the elevator game. We enter the elevator and we go to floor one, and we leave and re-enter to reset the sequence, although this step may not be necessary. From floor one, we go to floor four, two, six, two, ten, five, and then back to one. There is a significant chance that on floor five, so the one before the final floor, a lady will walk in and try to interact with you. Don't look at her, don't talk to her, ignore her. Here's the footage of what that sequence looks like. When we punch in the last floor number one, the floor goes up to floor 10 and then the doors open. Leaving the elevator, we head left and enter a room. In this room is just a lone window. Peeking out of it shows a red cross diabolically looming over the cityscape. This is probably the most flimsiest pile of conjecture I will spit at you guys in this entire series. And yet I am so very hoping I got something right that Erdorf didn't think anybody would notice. But here it goes. What if the floor that we are on is floor 490. The elevator indicator, the floor indicator, doesn't go past 10, so it wouldn't have told us 490. It just couldn't display that number. This would make sense as to why Tiffany says not seven, but seven times 70. I'm not on floor seven, but floor 490, the floor beyond, the floor of perfection. Now back to this window that we saw in this mysterious floor that exists beyond the realm. What if we are seeing the sort of this unholy tamim, this unholy completion of the profane Sabbath, this symbol, what, what, what could be this, you know, this red cross, what could be a symbol of the Antichrist looming over the cityscape, a completion of a sort of unholy cycle. Now think back to the crosses we've been wielding. It's been gold, silver, brass, and now we also have this red cross that we're and analyzing here. Daniel, one of the great prophets of the Ketuvim, or the writings of the Old Testament, was sought by kings for his prophetic visions about the cycles of kingdom. One king asked them to decode a dream about a statue made of various materials, a head of gold, a torso of silver, thighs made of bronze or brass, and then from the legs going down into the feet, uh, iron, and then into the feet, it's a mixture of iron and clay. In this dream, suddenly a rock or boulder is thrown and the statue comes toppling down. Daniel, mind you, this is in the time of Babylon. Daniel interprets the golden head to represent the current kingdom at the time, which was the Babylonian kingdom. He then interprets the silver, the silver torso to be a future kingdom, powerful, but inferior to the Babylonians. 
and then he interprets the brass, a further inferior powerful kingdom that happens after the silver kingdom. The iron legs represent a very powerful empire, very strong and very cold. But as time goes on, it gets more brittle as more as other kingdoms and other people get mixed into this empire and it becomes brittle be with the mixture of all this clay. So the cycle goes from gold all the way into these brittle clay iron feet. We have the golden cross, golden head, silver cross, silver torso, brass cross, brass or waist and thighs. What if this red cross is supposed to like symbolize sort of oxidized iron, or perhaps some forms of clay being red. I mean, it, like it, I, I, it's like a cycle, right? It's like a big old cycle. You have at the beginning chapter one and it ends with the profane Sabbath. You have this profane trial and that ends in a tribulation. That's kind of how, anyhow. Uh, what if this symbol signifies the end of the era of man and the coming tribulations of the profane Sabbath? <sighs> Honestly, now that I've organized my thoughts, I mean, these are all some pretty cool ideas, but I think they're held together with very flimsy string. But I think it's safe to say, ignoring my Daniel thing, this window is showing us the looming threat of the profane Sabbath, and perhaps even symbolizing the Antichrist. Because after all, simply put, it's red. Red is the color of evil in this game. Gary, the thralls, demons, they're all red, so this would be like a red cross Antichrist. You head to the right of the elevator and see the elevator friend walking away with Timmy. Oh, there they are. Here I am. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, after last monologue, I just couldn't help myself. I need to embarrass myself once more. Remember in chapter two, behind the Snake Meadow Hill Church, there is a scarecrow warding over a doomed child? If we walk to that scarecrow, we see a big eye and a creepy triangular face. What does that remind you of? Instead of straw, we have this effigy made of flesh with a creepy triangular smile and a big red eye looming over, over Timmy, a doomed child. Boom, foreshadowing, symbolism. Faith is like poetry. It tends to rhyme. We enter the room on the right and follow demonic symbols to the secret boss of act two. My God, Amy, is that you? Listen to this! Did Aerodorf just hear a fax machine and go, Yo, this bumps! What a lie, if only John Cage was alive to hear this. <laughs> There's, if you can find the video to this track on YouTube, the top comment is something around the lines of, Never hand the faith fan the aux cord. I love it though. It's aggravating, it's super stylish. It's probably the reason I had such a hard time with this boss, because the fear it instills. This boss is very straightforward but very hard as well, for she moves very fast, so it requires a bit of projecting where she's gonna be. You don't wanna just reactively dodge her, you kinda wanna dodge where you, where she's gonna end up being, because her movements are predictable, just very fast. Mother I should be able to dodge those, I've watched enough uh, you know, DVD bounce screensavers. Oh my god. 
Tiffany refers to herself as the daughter of the profane Sabbath. I'm starting to see a pattern here. We have a mother in Act 1, and we have a daughter in Act 2. The subtitle for the game Faith is The Unholy Trinity. Instead of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we have Mother, Daughter, and Unholy Spirit. So in order to attack the unspeakable and its closest assets, we need to go straight for the Unholy Trinity. This is the key to the good ending. Also, keep in mind the fact that Tiffany is pink and the daughter of the Unholy Trinity will play a role in Act 3, the daycare. So, we have a blue cop in association with a bird, orange mother, and pink daughter. We defeat the daughter of the Unholy Trinity, and we see a plethora of souls and ghosts emit from her demon-fused body. If these represent sacrifices, then she has been busy in the most vile ways. We enter the hallway and see a note, but first we repel one final attack from Tiffany's headless body. We exercise her and she dissipates into a red spatter. We pick up note 28. Note 28. Well done, priest. You wasted another day aiding a worthless soul and you got rid of Tiffany from me. Are you sure you know who's sad you're on? We'll find out soon enough. Remember, Gary loves you. Hmm. So up until now, I always thought that the worthless soul we were aiding was Tiffany, which is why I previously alluded to this theme of forgiveness. We are going out of our way, entering the abyss beyond the physical realm to save the soul of a truly wretched person. I interpreted this as the essential step in Father Ward forgiving himself. If he can go out of his way and send a truly vile cultist to eternity instead of letting her rot aimlessly in this demonic backrooms, which is a fate I think many of us might think she deserves, then truly Father Ward can find it in himself to forgive himself for being a simply fallible person prone to fear. But no, you could probably chuck all that analysis because the worthless soul that we aided that Gary is referring to is likely Lisa. So this has been a very humbling act to say the least. I once thought my low intelligence stat was balanced out by perception, but it seems all I've got going for me is my charisma and ability to put away hmm, alusimosas. We enter the elevator and see a hole labeled Damnasio Memori. Ah, oh, crap. Do I have to break out the stage blood again? No, you're, you're chilling. Now, this is likely the Damnasio Memori for another character. We don't know of this character because, well, they got Damnasio memori Ah, oh, oh, very interesting, very interesting. So, floor seven lies in the beyond. Something must have happened on floor seven to initiate a damnatio memori, just like how the Martin house disappears at the end of the bad ending of chapter three. Someone had their own bad ending and the entirety of floor seven was Damnasio Memori, removed from existence. That's why there's no door, there's no way, and the, the elevator glitches out when you try to go to floor seven. We approach room 7A, confirming that on the other side of this Damnasio Memori is floor seven. Entering room 7A, we see a truly disturbing tableau. There we see the corpse of Timmy lying in a pile of gore, not unlike the gore that made up the elevator friend. We see this elaborate plethora of lines dotted with unlit candles, and last but not least, imposing upon us is this statue of a skeletal figure donning a face similar to the elevator friend. It's wearing a crown and is holding what looks to be a serpent in its right hand and a sword in its left. This reminds me so much of that Payman statue in Hereditary. I mean, have you ever seen Ari Aster and Erdorf in the same room? But hold on. That's not where it ends. To our right, we see a wheelbarrow full of gore and a knife stuck in the table. A <laughs> little sound effect. That's the noise it makes when you stick a knife in the table. <laughs> if you peer really closely at those three pixels on the table, it looks like something was chopped off. A small piece of something lies on the table. Part of me wonders, based on the one end of those three pixels being black or like a really dark color, if that's a plucked out eyeball, and it would explain why the elevator friend only has one eye while its statue form has two. Exercising the statue doesn't have the same typical effect of causing a soul to drift out of it. 
no noise is played either. Instead, Timmy's body sort of phases and disappears. We pick up note 27, a small lamentation. He promised me so much, I just wanted to see my little boy again. The replacement is almost fully formed, just a few more bodies. My camera stopped recording in this moment, and I very quickly realized this. However, I failed to reiterate after recording again that the person who had committed all these sacrifices to create this replacement for Timmy must have sacrificed so many people and committed such evil in this sacrifice that they led to the Damnatio Memori of themselves and Floor 7. I'll go over this in the final whiteboard for the apartments, but I wanted to point this out now since I didn't have any footage of me doing so. Perhaps this parent or loved one that was distraught that was trying to bring Timmy back or bring a replacement of Timmy into existence was fooled by somebody. Fooled into sacrificing and mutilating different people and putting their body parts together to create this demon in the hopes that they would bring back Timmy, but in fact they were just doing the bidding of whoever fooled them. The person who was fooling them could either be Gary or that sort of whatever god or principality is represented in that statue that looks like the elevator friend. We make our way back to the car, and on our way home, the image flashes before our eyes of the second part of the Unholy Trinity seal disappearing. And so completes Act 2, The Apartments. So let's start with Timmy's story. Because of somebody's most unforgivable act, all of Floor 7 is damnatio memoriae. It exists beyond even the beyond or unseen world, which is why the only way to access the unseen world is through the elevator game, and the only way to make it back into our world is to make a detour through the realm of damnatio memoriae. We know that Timmy had an imaginary friend. He had food allergies and was already in correspondence with Gary Miller, who we will come to find out is the landlord of the apartment building. Either through accident or through cult meddling, perhaps with the use of Timmy's allergies, Timmy passes away. A loved one, perhaps a parent, is distraught and vulnerable to cult manipulation. It seems that he, either Gary or whatever principality this elevator friend statue represents, fooled, or I should say convinced, the loved one to sacrifice people, cut up people, to create the replacement for Timmy. I say fooled because it's pretty evident that the elevator friend is made up of flesh and body parts. This loved one must have killed so many people and done so much evil in this effort to create a replacement for Timmy that they ultimately got punished with the Damnatio Memori completely wiping away any evidence of existence, including the entirety of Floor 7. There as well, Timmy's soul, or perhaps a replacement of Timmy, spends the rest of eternity with their BFF, the Elevator Friend. This reminds me a lot of Cindy's story. Distraught by the passing away of her children, she tries to create replacements for them. Only instead of a duet of hewn wooden replacements, in this case, we have a single flesh golem. Now that concludes the story of Timmy, the story of Floor 7. Now, on to the bulk of Act 2. When we first enter the New Haven apartments, Lisa is locked behind a seal in her room. This seal is the seal of Alu. Now, it doesn't make sense that Gary and Malthus would have her sealed away because they want her for the second death ritual. It makes a lot more sense that Tiffany, wanting to be Gary's favorite again, with the help of this new demon Alu, locks Lisa away until Gary comes to his senses and accepts Tiffany back into the fold. But at some point, Tiffany commits the second death act on herself with a ritual mask and a ritualistic knife. We now have confirmation how that second death wound is created through the mask and that knife. After committing this act, she enters the unseen world alongside her demonic attachment, lying in wait for Gary to come to his senses and accept her into the fold. But instead, the person who finds her is Father Ward. She calls herself the daughter of the profane Sabbath, or I think the daughter of the unholy trinity. Father Ward defeats her and her demonic counterpart and yeets her into eternity. 
Aside from Tiffany and her secret boss fight, the four big antagonists that are involved with the apartments are Gary, Malthus, the peekaboo demon, and Alu. Gary is the owner of the apartments, the peekaboo demon, a dweller and tenant, Malfas, a demon worshipped by thralls and tenants in the apartments, and Alu, a sort of intrusive demonic species introduced by Tiffany. We say goodbye to the peekaboo demon once and for all, same thing with Alu, and now all we have left is to finally face Gary and Malfas in the third chapter. Some things to keep in mind. Tiffany mentions that she is the first to commit the ritual, the second death ritual, willingly. Now, I'm going to jump the, the gun a little bit here and say we're going to find some information in chapter 3 that disputes that uh, claim. The second thing we want to keep in mind is what is the extent of Lisa and John's history? What is the extent of their friendship? We will get that question answered, don't you worry. And of course, just like with the orange mother and the dark blue bird in the first act, keep the concept of a pink daughter in mind for act three. And so concludes act two, the apartments. Now, let us move on to act three, the daycare. We enter our next flashback dream sequence, starting with where we left off last night. With our newly acquired cross, we walk up and, ooh, oh, that's creepy as hell, man. I know it's just Atari graphics, but I've been playing this game long enough to convert everything into high fidelity PNG in my mind's eye. And boy, the idea of a creepy ass lady with a red, red smile grimacing at me in the back of a basement gets me all puckered up, man. Take a look at her sprite though. That's Cindy. Walking towards her causes the screen to go black and her to disappear. I think this is to simulate that experience we have when we see a creepy shape in a dark room and blinking as it disappears into a less distressing shape, like a mannequin. Only this time, that thing we saw likely was actually there. I want to say we'll be keeping this in mind, but I don't even know what the hell any of this means. Well, if you notice, out of the four possible places Cindy can spawn, or her apparition can spawn, three of them have mannequins around them, which would kind of make sense there's sort of creepy, spooky attachment to the thing she tried replacing her children or her twins with. If you think back to when we meet Nate and Jason in the bad ending, they are hewn from these wooden mannequins, being represented by this occult malignment of them, just as Amy and Michael represent themselves in the bad ending in that same way too. Maybe Cindy was somehow inspired by that doll that was sent back from Bob when he was stationed in Nicaragua. We'll get into that in their final rundown. But in the meantime, keep all of these strange details surrounding Cindy in mind. We do a bit of wandering. We find ourselves in the master bedroom. We find Bob's glasses. We can only see what looks like Bob in the mirror. Taking a look at the destroyed family picture in the foyer, it now all makes sense to us. The eye above Amy, the fact that the, there's a huge hole where her face is, Honestly, with how much we've learned, I can imagine playing chapter one again and just having a new set of eyes and it making a lot more sense now. Before we go upstairs, check out this secret cutscene if we try weaseling out of this dream by walking away, walking out of the Martin household. I think that's pretty neat. We make our way upstairs and listen to Father Ward's voice. Hello? Hello? Amy, are you in here? That hello, it, it, it's almost childlike. It, it, you can really feel the fear in his computerized Atari Better Sam voice. More and more, we're kind of finally understanding how deeply Father Ward was affected by this. He isn't just the sort of default coward. He was changed by this night. We face Amy in the attic. You're, you're at risk. Amy, let's go back to the basement. You're so sad, Deary. Let's go. You need to get better. What about Deary? This big sheep is bigger. You should be saved, sir. Good, you. That's enough. She's here with me. You go. We are going to sit here and now. Oh, oh, by yourself. Please, 
Dr. Aller and Mr. Barton. Please. We wake up from our dream and it's October 30th, one day until the profane Sabbath. We pick up Note 29, a letter from Father Garcia, giving us our last assignment to investigate a daycare where some children are exhibiting strange behavior. For some reason, Father Garcia has a hunch that the twins may be here. We approach our neighbor to see what they're viewing on TV. We now start to see things change on the television. The programming is devolving and, and what they're watching is now distressing. We are now starting to see how things are devolving as we get closer to the profane Sabbath. Some images on the TV can include the word kill, Amy twitching her head violently, the word Gary loves you, symbols like a bird, a chalice, a star, and a moon. We'll come to find out these being very important symbols in the profane Sabbath. But there are many more possible images that can flash on our neighbor's screen. We hop in our car and head to the daycare. On our way, let me fill you in on another thing I missed. Remember in the secret ending of chapter 2's prologue, we set ourselves on fire and use that fire to set a scarecrow on fire? Oh, hold on. Oh, hold on for a second. This is fat foreshadowing. I didn't even realize this until now. So, keep in mind. Keep the act of setting oneself on fire to set another thing on fire in mind. For reasons I don't want to get into just yet, based on this realization, I think this scarecrow is supposed to symbolize Sister Miriam. I would also argue that the way the children surround the scarecrow harkens back to the way that the children are described as dancing around Sister Miriam. Also, that would explain why this sequence sets off a unique encounter with Sister Miriam. But it's not, that's not even why I'm even bringing this up in the first place. We're discovering so much, even in real time. The reason I even bring up this scarecrow tableau in the first place is because in my initial interpretation I was having trouble explaining this scene, the significance of the twins being there and the nine children. This is because I was interpreting the twins as a visual motif for Nate and Jason when it's most likely supposed to symbolize, in this case at least, the twins that were the final two children kidnapped by Sister Miriam. Okay, so six orphans killed by the cornfield demon. Six orphans kidnapped by Sister Miriam. That's twelve. So we have a set of twins, that's two orphans, plus the nine we see on the screen surrounding the scarecrow, but that makes 11. We're missing one. Or are we? Okay, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Oh, yes! That's, that's it! That's fucking it! Oh, it's so sick. You figured okay. it out? Yeah. I've said enough. This... Chapter 2 Scarecrow Tableau will only be part of the evidence to fully understand the true backstory of the good priest Father Ward. Nonetheless, keep this in mind. Oh boy, we are now reaching the final stretch of our journey with Father Ward, yet in many ways we are only just getting started. Father Ward makes the call to park a distance away from the daycare. We see a police car speed by us in the daycare's direction. The cops are swarming the daycare's entrance. A lot of people tend to overlook this detail. Parallel to our investigation, law enforcement is also running their own investigation against Gary and the Second Death Cult. I wonder what tipped them off. Perhaps the shutting down of the clinic led to an investigation and the cop being killed at the clinic labeled Gary and his cult wholesale cop killers. This tends to piss off police departments. So you've gone from a sort of beat cop investigation in, in the clinic to now a full-blown sort of siege in, in the daycare. Eh, I could be drawing some flimsy conjecture from this, but I digress. Keep these cops in mind. Not for the whiteboard, but for a, a cute little cutscene we're gonna see in a moment. We make our way around the daycare and find a break in the chain link fence. We walk through and find note 30. Gary taunts us with a riddle. How do you open a portal to hell? How do you open a portal to hell? This will be one of the big reveals of chapter three. Once we get the answer to this riddle, a lot of the motives regarding the second death cult will be explained to us. So keep this portal to hell in mind, but I'll give you a hint. We've actually gotten 
one step to this process, and we got it as early as chapter one. We enter the daycare, and the title on the next segment is The Tunnel's Wait. Harkening back to the tunnels that were talked about in chapter two, both the prologue and the main chapter. We enter the daycare and we view a drawing by a child named Ben. The drawing depicts a red person playing with six children as a red star shoots above their head. I'm of the mind that this red person is Gary and the red star will be a sort of symbol for Gary. Even in the main menu when you're first loading up the game, there is this poem about a red star or a star falling from the sky and then a whole bunch of Gary loves you on the screen before the game loads in. We see a drawing of a stick figure on the chalkboard with a three-fingered hand coming out of its head. This is a common motif for the second death. What are they teaching these kids? We enter the next room and... Are, are those kids? Are those kids? <sighs> Dramatics aside, looking at these corpses, they look a lot more like the cultists and the thralls that we would see in the apartments, but that just might be a cope. Listen, the second death cult is evil. I wouldn't put it past them to sacrifice children. <sighs> we see the alphabet devolve into demonic letters and trail off into the phrase, Gary loves us. We see four red corpses surrounded by a blocked trap door that can only be opened by solving a puzzle. We pick up note 31, a note written in Amy's purple. We see a mother moon, a daughter chalice, and a spirit bird mentioned. That's the unholy trinity. Mother moon watcheth her little ones behind a door of sleep. Ignore the puzzle for a moment. Who does this sound like? A mother who watches her little ones behind the door of sleep. Sister Miriam calls us her little one from within our dreams. But for the sake of this puzzle, the character we will associate with the color orange is the orange mother in the clinic. Daughter Chalice is filled with an offering to the master in an unseen world. That's obviously Tiffany. She even refers to herself as the daughter of the profane Sabbath. So that's our pink daughter. Spirit bird arriveth from afar and come back to roost. Now we haven't faced the unholy spirit of the unholy trinity, so we don't have a color to associate with them. However, think back to that bird we saw outside of the clinic that was sacrificed, and then in its place, a dark blue cop was sacrificed. So, dark blue bird. The fallen star shall guide them. Now, this isn't part of the Unholy Trinity, but I'm of the belief that this fallen star is meant to be Gary, the elusive antagonist that writes in red. So, orange mother, orange moon, pink daughter, pink chalice, dark blue cop, dark blue bird, and red Gary, red star. Now, of course, the traditional way that Amy tells us to solve this puzzle is to look to the children, or look at their drawings, but it's interesting how chapter three has sort of been giving us the answers to this puzzle subliminally throughout its story. So, Ben's drawing from the previous room had a red star. The next room has a drawing by Tara. Nothing too sinister on this drawing, so we move to the next. The next one is a truly creepy picture. We see a blue kid and, oh, wait, wait a second, hold on. Oh man, you already know, man. This has got to this has got to be something here, man. You got to keep that in mind. Yeah, we see a blue kid, like Father Ward, blue, picking mushrooms with what looks like to be a monkey and a creepy lady. Well, obviously, never mind. This is signed by a kid named Mason. Yeah, now that I think about it, why would some random kid in a daycare be drawing a picture of a young John Ward? Like far after the, f yeah, okay, now this is, ignore that, that's fine. You're a blunder, a blunder on my part. Yeah, false alarm. Anyways, we do see an orange moon, so orange moon. Our next drawing has none of our puzzle shapes, but features an interesting story. A demon causing a child, a cat, and a creepy shadowy figure in a window to cry. When one creepy entity is making another creepy entity sob, you're dealing with a pretty creepy entity. We carry on to another drawing by Tyler. Nothing too sinister, but we do see his uncle Earl about to get swamped by the man-man. We see another drawing by Max, a red demon with a crown holding a pink chalice. So this is our pink chalice. This reminds me a bit of the idol we saw to the elevator demon. 
Before we get to the next room, check out this cutscene when we <laughs> go out the front door to meet the cops. No, but we don't do that. So we go to our next drawing and we have an unsigned drawing of a family with a demon hanging from a ceiling. I'm sure there's a creepy picture around on the internet somewhere, a very famous one of like a corpse falling from a ceiling. It reminds me a lot of that picture. We see a drawing signed by Amar of a red figure under a star-filled night. The next drawing is of Pathfinder from Apex Legends. Come on, you know you want to. The temptation is just far too great. No, in all seriousness, it's V1 from Ultra Kill, a game published by New Blood, the same publishers of Faith, the Unholy Trinity, but more importantly, developed by R.C. Patala. If you really liked Faith, I highly recommend you check out all these other indie games under the New Blood umbrella. They're all very unique, very different, and there's little, little to no overlap between them, so you get a very unique experience with each one of them. The next drawing is of the unspeakable, looming over six kids as they celebrate the death of what looks like to be a cleaved Father Ward. We enter the next room and, oh, what the hell is that? It's like a flower hanging meat decapitated flayed lobster claw thingy Ugh. i don't know what that is so before going to that side of the room we check this room's drawing the signature is too obscured but it's of a kid dancing in money with what looks to be his parents decapitated giving that like that nixon pose <laughs> it's just <laughs> this face is just so funny and stoic above them in writing is thanks satin and <laughs> and the red eye which is again one of the cult's insignias we go to the other side of the room to inspect that weird shape and... Oh, come on! The final drawing is of a scarecrow being devoured by a dark blue bird. Alas, we have found our colors associated with their shapes the way we were meant to find them. This is just a peripheral. I'm not going to go to the whiteboard for this. But again, check out how it's a scarecrow being, you know, nommed on by a blue bird. We'll get into what the blue bird could mean later on in this chapter. We set the shapes to their associated colors and head down into where it lives. We make our way through the red corridor. We see some cultists leave from a ritual site. It's an upside down triangle with bits and pieces of something or somebody within it. I think these pink chunks are supposed to symbolize innards and you'll see why also in later cutscenes. We exercise this profane geometry to reveal note 32. Note 32. If you are reading this, then congratulations. You are on your way to experiencing the wonders of our unspeakable future under the guidance of Gary. Gary, our brother. Gary, our friend. Gary, a normal human being just like you and me. As a Tier 1 acolyte, you are just beginning your unspeakable journey to eventually see what Gary sees and prove yourself worthy to be a vessel fit to experience the second death, reserved for only the most worthy. To find out if you are a vessel, remember to attend meetings of the Eternal Order of the Second Death twice a week, following Gary's instructions exactly. Be honest with him in all you do. Do not ever ask what is behind the door in the basement of the clinic. So at level one, you are made aware of the second death, the unspeakable and Gary, but yet you can't know what lies behind the basement door to the clinic. It's interesting. Part of me wonders if this gore we just exercised belonged to a tier one acolyte, but let's press forward. We make our way down some stairs to pick up note 33. She consumed six little twigs. Only two were left to walk as husks. Go ahead, priest, stare into the eyes of my mother. So of the six children that were kidnapped by Sister Miriam, four of them were killed, yet two of them were left to walk as husk. Yeah, baby, remember this one. We walk over to a painting of Sister Miriam. It's slowly degrading. We will be analyzing two more paintings of this maldita pinche bruja in a moment. The hands of Sister Miriam pull her painting in, and the hole that was behind it has gotten big enough for us to climb through. If you look at the hole before, it looks specifically before we look at the painting, we see some more of those bits and pieces and purplish gore similar to the previous ritual site. It looks like the cultists are creating a path for us to follow. We will proceed deeper into this domain of Gary to walk upon this blasphemous parody of the real-life statue La Pieta. 
We pick up note 34. This statue was commissioned and donated by the saved family, the family who owned the tomb you could save your progress in in chapter 2. The statue is called La Pieta Corota, or The Corrupt Pity or Corrupt Compassion. Basically, the original title of the statue, but with the word corrupt slapped on top of it. We save our game and exercise this foul graven image to reveal note 35. Note 35. If you are reading this, congratulations. You have officially been granted tier 2 status in the eternal order of the second death. Upon crossing the threshold from Tier 1 to Tier 2, your life as an acolyte will change dramatically. You may start noticing shadowy figures in the corner of the rooms, or experience feelings of lost time when holding sharp objects. Ancient symbols written in blood will materialize on the floor and walls of your home. Animals will no longer trust you. You may emit a foul odor that will cause your former loved ones to avoid you. These are just a few of the marvelous blessings that await you in this new stage of life. If you remain loyal to Gary, your journey towards becoming a vessel for the second death will progress to new levels of knowledge and power. Remember, if you neglect your weekly meetings or do not pay your tithes to the order, your fingers will be forcibly bent backwards. And remember, Gary loves you. This is honestly such a cool bit of world building from Erdorf. These little symptoms of delving into the infernal and how it has these very real effects that just sort of make sense. But nothing says I've passed the hellish Rubicon more than being stalked by shadowy figures out of the corner of your eye. Which come to think of it is eerily similar to the experience we have in chapter 2. We see dark figures in the corner of our eye and stab ourselves in the eye with a sharp object, which isn't exactly losing time with a sharp object, but something. We go to the right and see some cultists. They chant, the second death, the second death, and Gary loves you, Gary loves you. Exercising them stuns them in place, but they restore to their original state when you leave the screen and return. But don't worry, because they don't actually do anything to you. We walk up to see a gate we can't cross. Keep this gate and its nearby cultists in mind for a scene we're about to decode in a moment. We walk to the left this time and... Yo, that's crazy! It's the Queen's Gambit board game from the movie Queen's Gambit! No, it's a chessboard with chairs. There are four hints as to how you can solve this puzzle, but you need not worry your head. I've just started playing chess, so I'll use what I've learned. I activate Bale and Andros to open with the El Diablo Thick Burger opening. My opponent responds with the Boyardee opening. They're playing for the mid game, so my best bet is to go for the long game. I activate Andros again, and Ordog this time, for the Indonesian sideswipe, but it's no good. My opponent reams me with the Burlesque Dancer special. It's no use playing long, so I go aggressive. I activate Bale and Andrus once again to initiate the Tap Tap Revenge Clause, a common move in chess. My opponent responds by injecting hallucinogenic drugs directly into my neck. It's the same move that fell Anatoly Karpov. What a blunder. We get high, unconsensually. We see a black little spot on a sun today. We see a black hat caught on the high treetop. We see a nasty ass switch. Oh, wait, no, sorry, that's a, this is actually lore. Hold on, that's Sister Miriam, standing in front of the Snake Meadow Hill Church with six orphans inside, one of them being John and the other Lisa. It's all coming together. This is insane. We see a flagpole rag and the wind won't stop. We see a <laughs> symmetric image. We see a fossil trapped on the high cliff top. That's my soul up there. <laughs> we, see, we see another symmetrical image. We see a moment during Father Ward's initial exorcism with Amy. And if you look real close, we see a dead salmon frozen in the waterfall. That's my soul up there. We see two stick dolls festering with maggots. We see a blue whale beached by a spring tide ebb. That's my soul up there. We see a child John and Lisa holding hands. We see a butterfly trap and a spider's web. That's, my, that's his soul up there. 
It's his soul up there. Okay, now this isn't a hallucination. This is actually happening. It's John Ward suffering from acute thralification. Notice the white eyes and creepy large white smile. We see a king on a throne with his eyes torn out, a blind man looking for a shadow of doubt. We see a rich man sleeping on a golden bed. We see a skeleton choking on a crust of, well, actually, I don't see a crust of bread, but it is a skeleton choking, trust me. We see a door with the second death cult eye on it. Father Ward places his hands in front of his eyes, peering through his fingers. I don't know, it looks occult. We see another quick flashback to Lisa crawling on her back while Father Ward exercises her. We see Amy's hands now covering Father Ward's eyes. Again, we see the second death eye door. It seems as if we're trying to- Oh! What the hell? Oh, we've seen the unspeakable and what I can only say is its truest form. No wonder we need to take hallucinogenic drugs, otherwise we wouldn't, be, been, we wouldn't have been prepared. Oh, we see a red fox torn by a huntsman's pack. That's my soul up there. We see a black winged gull with the broken back. That's my soul up there. And finally, in Gary's red text, now you are ready. If you hadn't noticed, for a majority of Father Ward's hallucinations, it's imagery of lyrics from the song King of Pain by Police. Listen, I hardly just got into analyzing movies and video games. I'm in no shape to be doing music analysis. But I can definitely say, I can imagine Father Ward relating to the song's lyrics and considering it his personal theme song. It's perfect for him. Now, if we take out all the King of Pain images, we are left with Sister Miriam and the Orphanage, which homed Father Ward and Lisa, explaining their friendship and all these small hints of Father Ward having history with Sister Miriam. We get these two short flashbacks of the failed exorcism of Amy Martin. We see the two stick dolls being eaten by worms and directly after that, again, if you truncate or remove all the King of Pain lyric images, we then see side by side John and Lisa as children. So two stick dolls being festered with maggots and then John and Lisa standing in the same exact position. And we also have that scene of Father Ward in his thrall form. He's wandering the red corridors and you can tell he's shirtless. This will be explained very shortly. It seems as if this drug has primed him to be able to cross past this red door and prepare him to truly gaze at the unspeakable. This hallucin, hallucin, this hallucination is plenty proof that Father Ward is far more connected than we initially thought. Think back to chapter two, the safe family tomb cultus. Remember there were four skulls that we had to disengage. We defeated three demons that were twisted reflections of three of those cultists, but the last one, the last skull was disengaged once we faced our own twisted reflection. I think this was the game telling us that we were one in the same with these cultists. Albeit, it's a bit flimsy, but you know what's not flimsy? Math. And while a set of two twins and nine orphans that were crowding around that scarecrow only equals 11 orphans, still, if we solve for X, that will equal 12 orphans in that tableau. But what is X, might you ask? X equals Father Ward. It's like a speakeasy out there. He is the 12th orphan in this tableau flocking around this scarecrow effigy, which I believe is an interpretation of Sister Miriam. And I'm just realizing this now. In this tableau, it has this big gaping hole in its face. That will become relevant in the future. But anyways, as I'm saying, the peekaboo demon told us, you belong to her. She will always be with you. She calls us my little one. But this role of Red Gary MDMA confirms Father John Ward was one of the six orphans that was kidnapped on that fateful night at Snake Meadow Hill Church. Alongside Lisa, mind you. She did some sort of ritualism on all six of them. Four of them were killed and she left those two, John and Lisa, to live the rest of their life as husk or walk as husks. From that point, we don't know how John and Lisa fared. We know that Lisa ends up moving into an apartment. Father John becomes a priest, an ordained priest. At least I think he does. It seems like there's a lot of people who think he's a fake priest out there, but this is it. This is the enigmatic backstory childhood of Father John Ward. We did it. We not only figured it out, but we put together evidence from all other places like the prologue to dream and all the, like the drawing in the dream. We've taken all this evidence and foreshadowed and we have figured it out. We've collected all the different ways that the game was telling us this 
perhaps not from the beginning, but from chapter two at least. Following this hallucinogenic bender, we drift to sleep, entering another flashback dream. It looks like Father Ward had lost control of the exorcism that we saw in the hallucination and in his previous dreams, and he's panicked. He's barricaded himself from Amy using the mannequins. Approaching the barricade causes Father Ward to say, there's no way in hell I'm going back in there. There are two ways to end this dream. The unorthodox way is to try leaving out the front door. Amy asks if we can lend a hand with washing the dishes. We say, don't you got a third? She says, oh yeah, true. <laughs> no, in all seriousness, I think this is Amy looking at us in disappointment, like, you don't get to get off that easy, priest. But I think the orthodox way to go about this dream is to enter the kitchen, and you can faintly hear Father Allred calling for help. So we heed his call, and his frantic voice gets closer as we get deeper into the basement. We find him. He's consoling us, telling us it's going to be all right. Oh, God! Now, if you're speedrunning this dream sequence, you may have missed a couple of gruelly, truesome details. In the parents' bedroom, you find Bob, disemboweled and strangled with his insides. And if you go into Amy's bedroom, you'll find the same has happened to Cindy. Do you remember that redacted letter to Molly from Father Ward? It turns out there isn't actually a note in game that reveals those redactions. However, on a live stream, Airdorf informs us what those redactions are. I guess that would be considered apocryphal, but eh, might as well be canonical. Father Ward's unredacted letter to Molly. Dear Molly, a year ago I was involved in the exorcism of Amy Martin. What they said in the papers about what happened isn't true. She killed my superior, Father Allred, with her bare hands. When I confronted her, she escaped, managed to cut the power to the house, and strangled her own parents with their intestines. So that's what happened to them? Uh, ew. We wake up from our dream on the other side of that gate. But I don't see any cultists either here or on the other side where they were before. I do see, however, a trail of blood leading to where we fell asleep. So we follow the trail of blood to... Wow. Yeah, that was us. That was Father Ward. The injection backfired and sent him into a thrall frenzy and he murked every cultist that tried throwing hands with him. He wrote, repent in cultist blood. And if you look closely, he drew a halo above another cultist corpse. There's this white line that looks like it skewered or impaled the cultist to the wall. I kind of wish I was a fly on the wall for this scene, honestly. But we do see a cultist crawling away. He says, please, no. So I do an Irish step dance on his back. Come out, you red robe man. Come out and fight me like a man. Show Gary how you praise devils down at Gary Land. Tell him how the Vatican made you flee for your Satan from a limping bluish priest. Oh, what a scary man. The cultist gives up the ghost and death rattles the holy man. Proceeding deeper behind Emily lines. <laughs> Proceeding deeper behind Emily. Proceeding deeper behind enemy lines, we stumble upon a statue of Moloch, a demon commonly associated with human sacrifice and will probably get me demonetized for even mentioning him. We need to find three items to place in these sockets on the statue, so we proceed further and find another safe statue. I didn't mention this before, but I wanted to point this out. The statue La Pieta Corota is supposed to depict the mother embracing a cultist who's undergone the second death. The prime mother of this cult is Sister Miriam. But notice on La Pieta Corota, the upside down cross on its face. This is eerily similar to the upside down cross on the cornfield demon's face. So let's remember this for a small theory I'll be going into regarding the grand army of the unspeakable. We exercise the statue and grab note 37. Note 37. Filthy acolyte, well met. The substance of Gary's influence flows through your veins. You are corrupted beyond repair. Your family and friends have forsaken you. There is no returning from the path you have chosen. Only Gary can save you now. Give up and fully let him into your heart and mind. 
If you do so, he will make you into a vessel worthy of the unspeakable. Resist, and your soul will be lost forever. Welcome to Tier 3. Gary loves you. I'm not entirely sure if the places we are finding these notes signify levels of clearance for each tier. Since we find the tier 3 note at this point beyond that gate, does that mean that only tier 3s can proceed ahead? Or maybe we're just being given the lore bit by bit in an equally spread out manner. Regardless, much like a tier 3 acolyte, there's no going back now. We proceed to the right and we see a red corridor with the painting of Sister Miriam. This is the key to the daycare secret boss fight, since we are supposed to gaze at our mother like we did with that first picture of Sister Miriam. We take a gander, and it is indeed a painting of Sister Miriam facing the Snake Meadow Hill Church. She's standing tall and is slender. Can't help but feel like this is supposed to depict her the first time she's approaching the orphanage. And that's not me being coy, I, this is genuine conjecture. The reason I say this is because when we go to the left, we see another painting of Sister Miriam. This time she's seated, looking far more haggard and homely than her other depiction. We go back and look at the picture at the right again and, oh boy, that is creepy. I tell you, Erdorf is seriously talented. I mean, you're working with like the length of 10 pixels by a width of three, and I can clearly see a red, vile smile forming on Sister Miriam's like, quarter profile as she's turning towards us. It's a still image, but it's, it's, it's like at any moment, at any moment, we're gonna see what's there and it's freaking creepy. Kind of actually reminds me a lot of Cindy's face when we see her in our, in our, our, our flashback dreams. I don't have really a connection there, it just reminds me is all. What a chilling image. And let's not ignore the moon above her head has gone from full to crescent. We go back to the left and we see the painting has changed as well. But I can't tell if she's standing now or if the view of the painting has just gotten closer to her as she remains seated. The painting has definitely changed though. We go to the right again and see the final phase of this painting. Sister Miriam herself has also undergone the second death. The final phase on the painting on the left depicts an obliterated Sister Miriam. It reminds me a bit of how she looks in those quick frames in her boss fight in Chapter 2. When we exercise her, she twitches, showing a very maligned form of her. And I think this painting is a more detailed image of that form, that true form. Now is the time for our secret boss battle. We face the unholy spirit of the unholy trinity, a glitchy face with a mouth that goes from one side to the other side of the face. So basically it's Canadian. That's nice. This boss is by no means hard, just kind of a pain. How many times have I said that about bosses in this game? Simply exercise it. And before it gets too close, enter another room and it will reset position. Camp at one side of the room and just keep exercising it guerrilla warfare style and you'll eventually beat it. Let me point out that while it's hunting you, occasionally you'll get Rorschach splotches on the screen. This will make far more sense if we let the unholy spirit attack us. It doesn't immediately kill us. If we do let it touch us, we are teleported to a reconstruction of John Stay at the Psych Institute of Yale. Look at the dark blue coloring on John. It's in line with the same color of the dark blue bird that represents the unholy spirit in the daycare puzzle. He's also drawn a bunch of crosses on the solitary confinement walls. We proceed down to enter what looks like a room of water containers. Maybe the Psych Institute practiced some sort of hydrotherapy, and I use the word therapy very loosely. We are being blocked by these demonic seals on the floor. We time our procession carefully as the unholy spirit is biting at our heels. In the next room, we see a white light coming from an ornate door. We found our way back on our path, and passing through the door, it takes us to where we left off. Before we proceed, let's really dig into that psych ward reconstruction. The Holy Spirit in Christianity, Judaism, and Islam is God entering a person and enlightening them, to put it simply. All people, whether they know it or not, have had experiences with the Holy Spirit, but some are lucky enough to have very explicit experiences with the Holy Spirit. For example, in Pentecost, the events of Pentecost in the New Testament, there is this scene where all the followers of Jesus, including Mary, are entered by the Holy Spirit. To outsiders, they seemed to be going mad, having a mass hysteria moment. But to them, they were being enlightened, being reassured in their walk with Christ. The Holy Spirit is a force of reassurance, whereas in the story of faith, the unholy spirit is a force of... gaslighting? But hold on. 
Tiffany literally gatekept Lisa from getting the second death. And the mother of the clinic is like the boss of the clinic. So quite literally, going from act one to act three, the unholy trinity is girl boss, gatekeep, and gaslight. Also, think about all the crosses on the wall in that solitary confinement. It reminds me so much of the crosses on the hallway in Father Ward's house. When he approaches that hallway door, he says, I'm not going in there. I think what he's meaning is that he doesn't want to relive those moments in the psych ward where his faith was truly at its weakest. If you notice the dark color of Father Ward's sprite in that reconstruction, perhaps that symbolizes him being preyed upon by the unholy spirit, which is why the spirit bird is a dark blue. It's no coincidence that on the other side of that hallway door, to Father Ward's knowledge, the only thing that's in there is his intake form from that night he spent, or time he spent, in the Psychiatric Institute. Although Father Ward's faith has been dwindling, it never gets to a point where he wants to accept that he's crazy or accept the delusion. Again, with the exception of chapter three's bad ending. Which reminds me, the only time we ever get notes regarding his institutionalization is first in chapter one, when we shoot the mirror, almost symbolically shooting ourselves or giving up, if you will. In chapter two, we get institutionalization notes when we go down the bad path, giving into our shadow self and our dark urges. And then in chapter three, the time that we get the institutionalization notes is of course in the bad ending, at which at that point he fully gives up and just has to look behind that door and get consumed by the delusion. It's kind of interesting how the world of faith is literally a world of faith, and that faith is basically always the right choice. Whereas in our world, you can't be superstitious, you gotta have some prudence and some discernment. But I'm rambling at this point. It's all coming together, and man, oh man, I just love Erdorf. After defeating the unholy spirit, we've done it. The unholy trinity has been demolished. From here on out, we have a guaranteed good ending. We head to the left, past the red painting of Sister Miriam. We pass this strange looking statue, but keep heading left. We pick up the first key to the Moloch statue, labeled Clavis L in our inventory. Basically, key left. We have to find Clavis L, Clavis R, and Clavis Naval. Picking it up is followed by Gary laughing at us, and the rear end of this dragon picture to glow red. I don't know what any of that means, to be honest with you. Maybe we've activated some sort of mechanism. Walking to the right and passing the statue causes another statue to appear from behind it or split apart from it. We see dialogue in a color not quite Amy purple, but not quite Tiffany pink. We'll find out who's speaking in a moment. The unseen speaker says, Quod tu estis fuimus talia. We were such that you are. We go to the right only to loop back to the beginning of the room. Pressing forward causes another statue to slide out from the front. We hear it say, Quod sumos editis tu. You will be what we are. This Latin quote is likely a reference to the story of the three living and three dead. It's a story that can vary between three young hunters, three kings, or a pope, a king, and a nobleman having dialogue with three cadavers. The quote is a warning of sorts. The cadavers are saying, once they were like the three living, and soon the three living will be like the three dead. After proceeding to the right once more, the room phases in and out. The three statues disappear, and a cultist appears in their place. In this playthrough, I avoided fighting this enemy by hugging the top wall, but here's what fighting it would normally look like. At first, it looks like a normal cultist, but then it mutates, a gross head bursting from its hood, and its pink flesh matches the pink text of the Latin, revealing that this was the person speaking to us. If you look closely at those statues, you can even see that it's depicting these three stages, a sort of maligned hooded cultist, then the hood separating and a mandible-like shape protruding from the hood, and then finally the hood fully separated and this large round head fully formed from the hooded figure. Boom, 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 boom. Mother. <sighs> okay. 
So on top of the cult's experimentation with hallucinogenic drugs on the thralls, it looks like some of these cultists are subjected to genetic experiments, mutations, if you will. In the game files, these cultists are called plagas cultists. Plaga in Spanish means plague, plagi in Latin meaning plague as well. So Gary has concocted on top of this hallucinogenic drug, a mutagenic property to transform his cultists into the Plagueis cultists, and perhaps that's also how he got the blind cultists that we see in chapter two. So Gary's army is primarily made up of chemically enriched thralls and cultist bioweapons. So what does Malthus's army contain? With one of the three keys obtained, we go to the right this time. We find another cultist standing in the middle of the room. To avoid this fight, simply hug the wall and proceed to the right. In the next room, we pick up note 36, an invitation to play a game with the cultist ahead of us. The game red light, green light is very simple. When the cultist is facing away from you, you can proceed forward, but don't get too greedy because when they say red light and turn around, if they see you moving, they will dash for you and kill you. So move bit by bit. When you get close to the key, don't pick it up immediately. Wait right next to it until the cultist red lights, then green lights again. The reason for doing this is because once you pick up the key, a demon from off screen will start slowly making its way to you. So you have to balance the urgency of running away from the demon with the calculation of not moving during the red light moments. It isn't too hard. And once you make it halfway, you'll be just fast enough to outrun the cultist, even if they see you moving. Now the tricky part. We have two Plagueis cultists and we can't sneak by them. At least not in the same way we've been sneaking by them before. What I like to do is aggro the top one. While it's locked in its tendril attack, you can walk by it from the top of the room and sneak by the bottom cultists without having to fight them. Now all that's left is the key to Moloch's navel. For those of you playing at home, make sure you're saving the game after every single one of these segments. From the safe statue, go past either painting hallway, then proceed north. This will take you to a room with two cages and a statue in the middle of it. This statue is actually very reminiscent of early concept art of Gary. These cages hold cultists within them, likely experiment subjects. We enter a mirror room and the navel key is stuck behind the reflection. Approaching it initiates our final standoff against the mirror demon. We need to make sure that the cracks in the mirror are managed so that they don't slow us down. We need our speed in evading the mirror demon's pursuit. Using the reflection, we position ourselves to exercise the mirror demon. When it gets close, we move down and across the room, back up and repeat. The mirror demon moves faster when it's far from you, but significantly slows down exponentially as it gets closer to you. Once we defeat it once and for all, we pick up our navel key and we can delve deeper into the belly of the beast. When you leave the mirror room, just head straight down, ignore the caged cultists. Sometimes they might aggro at you, but you can move down. You'll be fine. We place the three keys into the idol of Moloch, and it even tells us it's pleased with our sacrifice. Newly initiated Bohemian Father Ward proceeds to the stummy of the idol. We descend and pick up note 39. When we pick it up, it's written in gray, the default color of notes. Note 39, Master of Spirits. The body of the mother stayeth suspended beneath the crucible of the profane Sabbath. Oh my gosh, master of spirits. Dude, my freaking connection was right all this time. Yeah, like the spirit is connected to father. Oh my gosh. Anyways, sorry, I'm soying out here. If thou canst unlock the final secret of the crucible, know ye this. The cross hath the power to weaken the mother, but only someone who is ablaze with purifying fire canst truly destroy her. If thou canst understand these words, thou shalt know the true cost of thy faith. These are instructions on how to beat the true final boss of the game. But who would be leaving us these notes that would be so detrimental to the cause of the second death cult? Looking at our notes from the pause menu, we find that the note is now written in Amy purple. Amy, like her twin brothers, are leading us to defeat this great evil. We keep her instructions in mind and proceed forward. We pick up note 38. Note 38. You are now a tier four acolyte. You have descended beyond everything that could possibly save you. Your words are not your own. Your actions are not your own. You belong, body and spirit, to Gary. 
Your face itches for the warm embrace of the ritual mask. You long for the blinding pain of the knife. You truly are Gary's chosen vessel. Fear not. Only a little longer, and you will experience the second death. Adios. <sighs> Gary, I only speak elven, common tongue, and duemma. What is this? It's Spanish. Spanish? Oh, like the imperial language. Uh, kind of the opposite. Well, actually, you know what? Uh, yeah, you're, yeah, actually, yeah. Adios, alma perdita. Gary loves you. Adios, alma perdita means goodbye, lost soul in Spanish. It's Spanish. Hmm. Could Father Garcia be involved in all this? Nah. Nah, it's strange, it's the random Spanish being spoken, but then again, Plagas is Spanish, so eh, maybe Gary is just bilingual. A very useful skill for a cult leader. But the note is helpful in confirming the mask and knife being key ingredients for the second death. That would make sense, actually, as to why I can even see it in my mind's eye, you know, the, the mask being placed on the face of the unwilling uh, sacrifice, and then being, uh, you know, the, that sort of, and you know, the circumference being carved, it's... <sighs> Can't wait to beat these guys. We go forward and embrace the darkness. Another phase to our journey that was prophesized in chapter 2. What follows is a descent down a series of corridors made of concrete walls and chain link fences. Darkness follows at our heels until we find a lantern labeled as Lucerna in our inventory. We follow the path back up, getting jump scared by birds. We start to see these blue, purple, I'm sorry, I'm colorblind. We see azure adjacent figures on the other side of these chain link fences. We get our final bird jump scare and are faced with our first encounter with what we will come to learn as an acolyte of Malthus. It's hard to tell, but notice how the eyes on the side of the hanging head mimic that wide set eyes of Malthus. And this sort of empty mouth, it's almost as if like a beak was once coming out of it and then you know, Malthus like, you know, and then yoop, it's the best way I can describe it. That's what I think happened. The concept art sketch paints a far more clear picture. Very creepy. You can then really easily draw the parallels between this maligned human, maligned alkalite, and the form of Malthus. They're not hard to fight on paper, but man, they are a pain in the butt in an upcoming sequence. After defeating the Acolyte, we follow demonic symbols on the ground, and what follows is my least favorite part of Chapter 3, maybe in the entire game, to be honest with you. Each of these paths of demonic symbols lead to a victim of Malthus. When we exercise them, part of the seal lifts. We must do this three times, and then we can proceed further. I'll rush through this sequence, but there is a diverting path to the north that takes us to Gary's cabin. We approach Gary's cabin, still shrouded in darkness. Entering it, we see a bloody circle with a trident-like arm coming out of it on the wall. To our right, we see a photo of Jacob, the antagonist of Dusk, another New Blood video game, Gary, and a character I'm unaware of, but likely another New Blood character, posing next to each other. A real who's who of evil bastards. We find note 40. My dearest colleague Jacob, thank you for the letter. I am delighted to hear of the success of your venture in Pennsylvania. However, it was not enough to persuade me to join your cause. I have no interest in crumbling ghost towns, nor government experiments, nor the gibberish behemoths that lurk shamefully in the darkness between worlds. Such matters are not worthy of my expertise. My methods may be more delicate than yours, but I assure you they were given to me straight from the source. The Antichrist will step forth very soon. The second death will consume this world, this pitiful fleshy sphere, still in its infancy, yet everlastingly too late to redeem. When the time comes, I hope we may reunite as cohorts, albeit not as equals. Love always, Gary. P.S. I almost forgot to thank you for the pet. I will keep it outside my private quarters as a guard against intruders. <laughs> That's kind of funny. Gary is passive aggressively dissing the ops that Jacob is running in dusk. He mentions a pet that Jacob gave him. Now keep this in mind for a unique encounter we'll be facing very shortly. 
we exit the cabin and we hear a whimper or groan and are ambushed by a grotesque enemy. It goes down easy, so easy that I don't get a good view of it. So here's an instance of me selflessly laying down the life of Father Ward for the sake of analysis. Here's also some footage of the enemy this is based off of in Dusk. They are called Horrors. H-O-R-O-R-R-S. Horrors. In Dusk. Truly creepy enemies, both in low poly and low bit graphics is kind of interesting. I can't help but feel like if you took this enemy and made it very high graphic and detailed, it would somehow remove the creepiness. There is an inherent value in this retro uncanniness. It's beautiful. Once we exercise the third victim of Malthus, the seal is lifted. We approach the door, now unsealed, and the game gives us a moment to ponder this Rubicon. We pass through. We are surrounded by still thralls. They form a corridor for us to move through. We hear the voice of Gary in the darkness. Thralls have changed, their heads flailing and wavering. Once again, we hear Gary's voice. Now they've completely deconstructed, completely rendered into flailing tendrils and limbs, creating an Atari-style wall of body horror. Gary's voice comes from the darkness again. Man, I don't even know what the hell this is anymore. What's going on here? Look at this. Gary's voice is a lot closer. He's near. We proceed into the darkness to find the final destination where Nate and Jason have been leading us. This next part confused me at first, but this is actually another flashback to the moment that Father Ward absconded from Amy in her first exorcism. Lord, help me. Somebody please help me. I hear thee. John, son of man, what dost thou wish? This is too much for me. I am so afraid. Please let me escape this place. And the girl? I just want to go home. If I leadest thou to safety, her fate shall be sealed upon thine head. I'll do whatever you want. Just take me away from here. Swear it. I swear it. We see Father Ward leave the Martin house to police cars and an ambulance. We have the full picture of that fateful night. No wonder Father Ward is the way he is. We'll get into it later, but man, it's good to have a full picture now. Also, I failed to mention, but note that after this dream, we sort of wake up into the profane Sabbath. So while this is all going on from here on out, the profane Sabbath is at hand. My name is Gary Miller. So you're the one behind all this. In the name of the Lord, I demand to know what the hell is going on here. <laughs> well, you have come this far. I suppose you deserve some answers. Fine, you get three quest jobs, but no more. 
So we can ask Gary three questions. Each set of choices is two different choices. So there's basically six things you can ask him in any two playthroughs. We, when we ask about Gary, he laughs. I'm a normal human being, just like you. My mission is to prepare this world for the Antichrist. To do this, I give my second death to my chosen people. Interesting. Honestly, I would think that Gary himself has all of the ingredients of an Antichrist figure. But when we ask about the injection, a gift, to prepare your mind and body for the unspeakable, to enter, but you can see the word enter flickering into the word abuse. You could not withstand its presence without it. Why the long face, priest? You should be thanking me. Regardless of what you choose, after the first question, his mouth goes slightly agape. You can see sharp teeth or spines emerging from his Levian goatee. For our second question, when we ask about Malthus, another spirit preparing the way for the Antichrist. The two of us together must fulfill the profane Sabbath. Oh, do not fret. Malthus has already been summoned to this plane. <laughs> So it looks like Father Garcia's efforts to prevent this summoning of Malthus was in vain. But don't worry, we certainly can still stop him. However, if we ask about the twins, deep down you always knew the twins were an illusion, but you could not resist chasing after lost souls, the word lost flickering into hurt, hurt souls. I suppose you wished that they were real, just like the late Miss Martin. That is how I knew you would come to me. Hmm. This challenge is a belief of mine. I still want to believe that the twins have been leading us to Gary in good faith. After all, why would Gary bait us into getting so close to him? He instructs his disciples to kill us, not capture us. If I wanted to defeat my enemies, why would I bait them into my very home? So I think both things can be true. The twins from beyond the grave alongside Amy have been leading us in good faith to defeat Gary, but perhaps Gary thought, being a powerful being, that no matter what, he could take on Father Ward. Regardless of what you choose for your second question, his head rises and tilts, his face contorts, revealing he's not as human as he claims. When we ask about the second death, the word victim flickering where vessel goes, First, we carve out the face with the ritual knife. Then we pass, oh, a living newborn through the opening and wait for a response in parentheses. And that, John, is how you make a portal to hell. That's vile. That is so diabolical. And that's why he ran the clinic, to fool parents into thinking they had miscarried, when in reality, their infants had been stolen and forced into a portal to hell as an offering? Son of a bitch. But when we ask about Amy, she was the perfect vessel, again like before, vessel flickering into victim for the second death. But then you came along and screwed it all up. No matter, once you've completed your journey, flickering in despair, she will be mine again. So, Amy has been out of his grasp, at least mystically. So we did screw up his plans in chapter one. Something we did in the exorcism of chapter one, the second exorcism of Amy, had thwarted Gary's plans. Keep in mind these different states of Amy for when we go over the final timeline of the Martin family, specifically Amy's timeline. After the third and final question, his whole head lengthens. His lower jaw is now a demonic maw and we can identify spiny large sockets peering over his Luciferian Ray-Bans. Aha! I know that sprite, I know that sprite from anywhere. 
that trident, the red cloak. Yeah, I don't know why I was being so coy about this during this entire series, but yes, the trident-wielding robed man has been Gary this entire time. We saw him in the bad ending of chapter one and in the bad ending of chapter two. It is kind of interesting that the trident that he chooses to wield heavily mimics the three-pronged arm that is commonly depicted as emerging from the second death wound. Fighting this form of Gary is not as hard as one might think. Every time we get hit, we fall to the ground and drop our crucifix, and Gary teleports to the top of the room and starts accelerating towards us. If we get to our crucifix in time, we restore to our initial state. We can never get a one-hit KO'd in this fight. But if Gary does get to us while knocked prone, we see a cutscene of Father Ward after being subjected to the second death. Fortunately for Father Ward, but unfortunately for this video, I never fell to Gary in this fight, so I don't personally have footage of this. It's a death cutscene, so we're not missing out on much. Gary has a few attacks up his sleeve. Aside from his various trident lunges, he can slow us while sending an apparition of a random enemy we faced darting towards us. He has an attack where he rains spiders down on us. And finally, he has an attack where he summons this large bony clown demon preying on our fear of clowns. But eventually, we overpower Gary. Ah, jeez! Que demonios, padre! No has oído hablar de la disciplina de Castillo? It's funny. Gary lumbers towards us, just like Sister Miriam did in Chapter 2, and just like that time, a gray man by the name of Father Garcia saves us, telling us to not be afraid. Only this time, Father Garcia is not wielding a crucifix, but a holy Mossberg. Gary flees from our two-man well-regulated militia into what we will come to know as the Crucible. The writing on the crucible is in Arabic and Hebrew. The Arabic translates to jinn, and Hebrew translates to dibik. In Islam, the jinn is a mystical species, much like angels and demons belonging to a sort of angelic species. Typically in pop culture, jinn are depicted as malevolent or mischievous forces of nature. But like humans, they have free will. Some jinn submit to God and some go against God. The dipic, on the other hand, is more commonly known in more mystical sects of Judaism, but correct me if I'm wrong with that. It's a more spiritual force. It's been understood by some to be a force of possession or a bringer of sickness and affliction. The common thread among most understandings is its need to attach to things, to infect things. I want to give a shout out to viewer Marwan, Zivor, and Moth H for giving me solid intel on these two entities. But what do Jin and Dibix have to do with Gary? Honestly, I think the dude was like, hey, Acolyte215, yeah, look up spooky, scary things in Islam. And while you're at it, can you also look up spooky things in uh, Judaism too? What is that? Jin and Dibix? Okay, cool. Can you go ahead and paint that on that big floating cube up there? What do you mean you forgot your big floating ladder and big floating paintbrush at home? Frick! Dang it! Man, I wish demons could cuss. While Father Garcia is fighting off thralls and cultists, Father Ward tests the fall damage in Gary's underworld and lands in the crucible. But first, he makes his way through the dilapidated home of the Martins, the same one we saw in the bad ending. All notes we find are note 42, and they simply say, the mantra of Gary's followers. The note at the bottom of the staircase, however, note 41, is different. Note 41. March 18, 1934. Miriam is ready. We will perform the ritual according to her instructions tonight. 
March 19, 1934. We successfully gave the second death to Miriam. We have been passing living newborns through the newly made portal as quickly as we can get them. So far there has been no response from the other side. March 23, 1934. After several days of sacrifices, we finally got a response. A tiny hand reached out from the portal. We took the hand and pulled out a baby boy. It appears to be a normal human baby, just like you and me. We named it Gary. This is the earliest account of the second death we get access to in the notes of this game. So let's maintain Sister Miriam's second death ritual in our consciousness for the final breakdown of the Unspeakable's army. This is an historical account of Sister Miriam's exposure and shenanigans in the Second Death Cult. She's been at this since at least the 30s. And that's interesting. Tiffany was not the first to do the Second Death willingly. Sister Miriam beat her to that. Several days worth of sacrificed newborns led to the spawning of Gary. There's no doubting it now, Gary is not a human being. He is a demon, and his mother is Sister Miriam, also known as the Mother of Demons. Being that all this took place in the 1930s, it had to have taken place even before Father Ward's birth. They've been at this for so long. We make our way to the attic, but in its place is the final room of our journey. Gary, in his true form, is revering his mother. We see a horned image in the place of God with its own choir of demonic cherubim and demonic ophanim etched around it. It's time to take this haram profanity down once and for all. Behold my mother, please. She tried to pick up the appalling tragedy, but her body was too to withstand it. After all these years, I found the perfect vessel to take that armor upon herself. But we both know how that turned out. You have pursued me as far as I will go. Only one of us gets out alive. I will make you the first mortal to witness the profane Sabbath and the first to be consumed by it. Oh, now this is truly blasphemous. Gary is telling John to behold his mother an upside-down version of when Christ from the cross tells the disciple John to behold his mother. Gary calling Miriam, oh, duh, Miriam. So in this case, Gary refers to Miriam as his mother, like it's my mom, whereas Jesus refers to Miriam, who we might know as Mary, as John's mother. Gary says, my mother. Jesus says, your mother. Listen, I might be a lapsed Catholic, but I'm a professional lapsed Catholic. A prolapsed Catholic. So Sister Miriam attempted to take on the full triune role of mother, daughter, and unholy spirit, but her age and mortality couldn't withstand it. That would explain the obliterated image of Sister Miriam in the left corridor. Gary tried again with Amy, and it could have worked, but our priestly meddling saw to it that it didn't. So instead the unholy trinity was brittle and decentralized, with the lady in the clinic serving as the mother, Tiffany serving as the daughter, and an unbound unholy spirit, perhaps pre-existing this phase, but being the parasite that attached to Father Ward through his ever-growing shadow self, or dwindling faith. But before I go, I will let you in on the secret. The fight has a few phases. The first phase is just Gary. He spawns obstacles in the form of sigils around the room, randomly blocking your way while pursuing you. He'll frequently stop and charge up one of two attacks, a very fast and direct lunge with limited range, or a fast sprawling attack that goes from wall to wall. Come out you fool Gary, you aren't nearly as scary. On your corpse me and Garcia will be down. And if you happen to slay me based on your talks with young Amy, you won't likely stand a chance against Chris Hansen. No hug for me? After doing enough damage, Malthus enters the fight for phase two. 
Malthus lingers vertically alongside either side of the room while shooting projectiles. He will occasionally fly up and either try landing on Father Ward or switch to the other side. Come out you Malthus too, let me break you two by two. Boy, you look like a demonic little tweety bird. Better tuck your tail and run, got a bullet with one gun. I'm afraid I will rebuke you with the holy word. Oh, nice! Let's get it. We win! We- ah! What the hell? Malthus, Sister Miriam, and the artist formerly known as Gary merge together. What persists is a bullet hell! Boss fight! We can get hit multiple times, but eventually if we take enough damage, we die and have to start over. The track of this boss fight is called Super Miriam. You can hear chants of Malfas and Astaroth in the song, Astaroth being the true name of Gary. It makes sense as to why he's described as the star. The seal of Astaroth in the Luster Key of Solomon is a star, and I wonder if the root word Astarte has something to do with stars. When we do lose a life from damage, John prays and says something. The order of quotes is, from the first hit, My God, take this cup from me. This abomination's power is too great, and yet it's not the end. Perhaps some divine intervention at last? Yes, Lord, I feel thou art with me. Thy saving grace transfigures me the power to save myself and those I love. But alas, I can't go on like this forever. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Our tenth hit. How often we forget. Faith without works is, and if we get hit for one last time, our eleventh hit, we die. Mortis. How often we forget. Faith without works is death. And now I just opened a can of worms in the comment section by just even mentioning that. Eventually, the three entities separate. We think back to the note left by Amy. We have to light ourselves aflame and carry that fire to Sister Miriam, just like was foreshadowed in the secret ending of Chapter 2's prologue. <laughs> Malthus dissipates, Sister Miriam explodes into a bloody mess, and Amy appears. Gary pleads to Amy, tries to praise Amy. I'm so sorry. I couldn't save you. It's over. It's finally truly over. Amen. Father Garcia and Father Ward leave the daycare, and although we stop the profane Sabbath from ending the world and bringing in the Antichrist, 
it still started, at least partially. We see a combination of police bodies and cultists or thrall bodies of what looks to be a near apocalyptic war zone. We make our way back to the car. So is it good? Yes. What I encountered out there was truly unspeakable, but I destroyed it with the help of the Lord. Good food. You destroyed a mighty people and disrupted the prophets of us. But the unspeakable is still out there. It must be hunted down and destroyed. You've grown stronger, John. I can see it. I need spiritual warriors like you. Cool. Lisa, what are you doing here? Cool. please do to. You don't have to keep fighting. We can leave this place together. Live the rest of our lives in peace. Lisa, I still have so many questions. I need to figure all this out or I'll never be able to rest. We have a choice. Fight the unspeakable with Father Garcia and live a life that will tax Father Ward even further than he already has been. Or finally rest alongside our kindred and sister, not by blood but by orphanage, and perhaps finally make sense of our strange childhood. We want to be the hero, and so it makes sense that most of us would choose Father Garcia. But I can't help but feel that Father Ward would be better off with Lisa. That finally resting is what he truly wants. Bravery and prudence, two sides of the holy coin. Our choice doesn't change anything gameplay-wise, just who we drive off with before the end credits. Choosing Father Wars leads to a cathartic bro clap, bro shake, brioche bun, I don't know. Choosing Lisa leads to this secret cutscene. Your habitation is a mortal seed, God. <laughs> Just kidding. It leads to Father Ward and Lisa holding hands, the same way they were holding hands in the hallucination. I'm of the belief that Father Ward still has feelings for Molly, so this holding of hands is not a romantic act, but simply familial. I mean, honestly, if the end of the world was just prevented, all I'd want to do is make sure my sisters were okay. I've had enough bravery for one lifetime. In my first playthrough, I chose Lisa, and I still stand by that decision. Let's go fight some demons. But kicking some traseros de demonios with Father Garcia sounds pretty epic too. Hey Father Garcia, you ever been to the West Coast? Great food. I think if we leave now we can make it in time before Lent. It is finished. Just like the daycare's custodian, we have quite the mess to clean up. What better place to start than the daycare, or better said, Act 3. A lot of the stuff we learned in Act 3 was better applied to the more specific whiteboards I had for the Martin family, Father Ward, and the Unspeakables army. But we do have quite a bit to analyze and appreciate in Act 3. It's by far the most elaborate of Gary's three business ventures. In the daycare, when we first walk in, we already get a very valuable symbolic key. The unholy spirit, the mother, the daughter, and the red star which symbolizes Gary. A sort of proto-antichrist. I think littered throughout Faith the Unholy Trinity, we see bits and pieces of other peripheral stories that may be parallel to the story that we're going through as Father Ward. Disregarding the red star for a moment, you can look at these three symbols and see rhymes in these peripheral stories. I think the spirit is to symbolize unwilling participants, those who are in far more deep than they realize. Father Ward, our dark blue priest, we also have the dark blue cop at the clinic who was in far more deeper than he realized and it led to his demise. The bald cultist from chapter two, Safe Family Tomb, who as a boy, against his will, was inducted into the cult living his entire life in the belly of the beast. Doubt, confusion, the enticement of inner peace are all weapons of the unholy spirit. 
And all these examples of peripheral characters I've given you in the story have some aspects of those qualities in their story, or as much as we could figure out from their story. But Father Ward has all three of those. His dwindling faith, his constant dumbfoundment throughout the entire story, and how as he proceeds and proceeds, he gets deeper and deeper into this unholy labyrinth. You can see a small mimicry of that in the cop who's investigating the clinic. And so it's very fitting that the color that the spirit is associated with is dark blue, which is the color of Father Ward, specifically when he's in the psychiatric ward, when his doubt was at its maximum. It would make sense that the playground of the unholy spirit is in the reconstruction, the psychological reconstruction of that stay at the Yale Psychiatric Institute. Perhaps the priest cop poster we saw in Tiffany's apartment was sort of the game telling us that Father Ward and the clinic police officer are kind of one and the same. This is one of my flimsier interpretations though. The mother could symbolize the more traditional understanding of how we typically see cult or cultists being initiated. Someone who is vulnerable, a perfect sponge, who's gone through some aspect of trauma, marinating their psyche for indoctrination. Think of the female cultist in the safe family tomb, for example. She had suffered a miscarriage, leading her to be a lot more vulnerable, a lot more malleable to the smiling lady and Gary. Ultimately, she chose to enter the cult, but through muddled agency. The orange mother in the clinic could have easily been a employee who through duress and coercion and just sort of massaged in grooming and indoctrination had joined the cult. If Tiffany, if what Tiffany said was true, that she was the first to willingly perform the second death ritual, then that would mean that Sister Miriam, the sort of prime mother of the second death cult, had then some level of unwillingness in her participation of the second death. What I'm describing are people who under normal circumstances wouldn't chase the occult, but through a level of indoctrination, a level of grooming had been marinated and sort of tenderized to be more formable. Speaking of mothers, we also have Cindy Martin, the mom of Amy Martin, who through her miscarriage, feeling isolated away from her husband and alone with her daughter, who was going through her own stuff, had quickly and rapidly became more and more vulnerable. And although she never joined the second death cult, she independently pursued the occult through trying to create replacements of Nate and Jason through these wood-hewn mannequins. I also failed to mention another perfect parallel to this symbol is the loved one that made all those sacrifices to find a replacement for Timmy only to get Damnatio memoried. This now uncreated loved one is a perfect parallel to the mother thrall in the safe family tomb and Cindy Martin. I kind of find it silly that I was trying really hard to make Sister Miriam work for this when we had a very good parallel right there in Act 2, The Apartments. But I digress. Let's move on. This is in stark contrast to what I believe the daughter symbolizes. The daughter symbolizes the full participants in the occult. The second death cheerleaders, the partisans of Gary. Going back to the safe family tomb, we have that cultist who, unlike the mother, unlike the bald cultist, was enthusiastic of getting into the occult, wanted to inflict pain on others and dive into sorcery. That's what I think the daughter symbolizes. And we get the same thing with Tiffany. She was a big cheerleader. She was willing to be a participant in the second death. She was disappointed that she wasn't chosen by Gary. I'm not trying to say I like figured out some sort of hidden symbolic narrative to Erdorf's story. It could totally be that all these characters rhyming with one another alongside these three symbols is purely coincidental. But I think it's indicative of how beautifully crafted and airtight Faith the Unholy Trinity is. So even if all of this is, turns out to be BS, think of it at least as a love letter to Erdorf and the work he did with this game. 
To finish off, let's appreciate the infernal labyrinth of Gary's daycare. We start at the daycare with the cops besieging it. We go down one level where we find the chess puzzle, which is the key to getting past this gate. We get injected by what I believe to be Gary. Father Ward goes on his rampage and breaks his way past the gate. Next level down, we see the statue of Moloch. We have to collect three keys, but also while we're here, face the unholy spirit through these two portraits of Sister Miriam. Aside from defeating the unholy spirit, in the obtaining of the Moloch keys, we face off with some Plagueis cultists and our final standoff with the mirror demon. Going into the belly of the beast once more and going down, we end up in Malthus's maze. That's what I like to call it. We get jump scared by spirit birds and we face off for the first time Malthus acolytes. Going deeper once more, we enter the forest where we have to cleanse three victims of Malthus, but we can also take a detour to Gary's little timeshare and we go down once more where we enter the crucible. Now, if we didn't beat all three elements of the unholy trinity, there will be a seal still on the crucible. As I've already explained, through the neutral ending, you don't defeat Sister Miriam, Malthus, or Gary. So you have two different possibilities. If you successfully saved Lisa in the apartments, Father Ward and Garcia will shake hands and join forces to beat the unspeakable's army. But if you fail to save Lisa, Father Ward will be so just beside himself and just so defeated and Father Garcia will not give you a choice. He will pull out his shotgun and tell you to get in the car, hijo. But that's irrelevant because we did the good ending. The good ending gets you the final boss fight. Through that note that we get from Lisa, not Lisa, Amy, we are told to use the crucifix to weaken Super Miriam, but the final blow to this unholy fusion is to set ourselves on fire and transfer that fire over to this unholy amalgamation. And that concludes the game. Now, let's clean up and break down the information we have on the rest of the major characters. Let's get the peripheral story of Father Garcia out of the way first. We actually have a pretty clear vision of how his story goes. The earliest event we see from Father Garcia is in the very beginning of chapter two, that small segment where we get to play as him. The events that take place in chapter two's intro take place chronologically before chapter one. Father Garcia wakes up. His closet door is closed and his cross is hanging above his bed. He walks through his kitchen and that's where we discover that Michael Davies, or the Chupacabra demon that we met in chapter one, has been in Father Garcia's now illicit custody for at least three months. We find this information out through notes and pictures of Michael as he's developed in his possession. We go down into the basement as Father Garcia and fail to exercise Michael Davies. He breaks his restraints and escapes. Now, this is where most players would just directly follow Michael, skipping to this segment right here where he's on top of a tenant and eating him. Canonically, Father Garcia first goes back to his bedroom to find his closet door mysteriously open. And this is actually the first canonical, or I should say, first chronological appearance of the clown nose. We pick up the clown nose, and when we walk back around the bed, the cross falls from above our bed. The reason I say this event has to happen canonically is because there's no other way that Father Garcia would have the clown nose on him in chapter one. So he picks it up, has it in his possession, in his inventory, if you will, and he drops it at the beginning of chapter one. Many have interpreted the clown nose as being a specific belonging of Father Garcia, like this is his clown nose that he has. And that's mainly because a lot of people just know about the, f the chapter one appearance of the clown nose. I'm of the mind though, that the clown nose is a calling card of sorts for whatever demon is either tormenting Father Garcia or afflicting uh, Michael. The reason I think this clown nose is being left as like a, call like a taunting act is because when we pick up that clown nose, the cross falls from above the bed. It's, it's like so whatever evil force put that clown nose there has enough of an effect in that area that it's causing the cross to fall off of the wall. It, it's like an evil presence. So after picking up the clown nose, we go outside and we see Michael munching on a tenant, that rotoscoped cutscene where his eyeball comes out of Michael's mouth. Michael then escapes, jumping out of a window saying, I have the body of a pig! And then Father Garcia hits the gritty after him. 
So this is taking place before chapter one. So when we actually play chapter one, we are seeing the gray man or Father Garcia after these events in the intro of chapter two. He is looking for Michael after he's escaped. Now this takes us to chapter one. Chapter one is basically put into three phases. We have the beginning phase when we walk out of our car for the first time and explore the forest freely. Then we have the second phase when we're in the Martin household. And then we have the third phase, the final phase where we pick up the gun and choose what ending we want for chapter one. In the first phase of chapter one, we can find Father Garcia as he first approaches Snake Meadow Lane on foot. As we approach him, he gets startled and runs off, dropping that red clown nose. We can pick up the clown nose, and just like when we pick it up in chapter two, it's labeled as nasus, or nose in Latin, in our inventory. This is the last time we ever see the clown nose as a pick upable item. I don't think Father Garcia intentionally drops the clown nose for Father Ward to pick up. I think the reason why he's laughing as he runs away is because chapter one was developed before there was even this idea of a Father Garcia. If you remember, in chapter one, he actually doesn't have the Roman collar. Perhaps at this time, Erdorf had some sort of clown substory planned, but decided to go a different route. Even to this day, all of the files regarding the gray man, at least in chapter one, have something clown related. The laugh sound effect is clown laugh. I even think the gray man is like, has like a, like a clown, clown run cycle, I think is what it's called. The next phase of the chapter is inside the house, where Father Garcia is peering in, seeing if Michael had made it into this household he's come across. And then in the final phase of the chapter, we can find Father Garcia guaranteed looking for Michael near the shed. And this makes sense because the shed is a guaranteed Michael encounter. The next event where, the next event where Father Garcia is involved, chronologically speaking, is before and during the final boss fight of Sister Miriam in chapter two, where he intercedes for us and helps us through our nightmares. But if you are of the belief that the gray man in Father Ward's dream is just purely a reconstruction within his own mind and not any sort of spiritual or mystical doing of Father Garcia for real, then the next relevant event would be directly after this moment where we read a letter from Father Garcia. The canonical ending for chapter two is the good ending. In this letter we get from Father Garcia, he's conscripting our help to defeat Malthus and ward off the profane Sabbath. This is where we first learn about Father Garcia's unique obsession with Malthus. Is our Gary Father Garcia's Malthus? Gary being responsible for the affliction of Amy Martin, perhaps Malthus is responsible for the affliction of Michael. Now, up until the final appearance in chapter three, his involvement with our story is through three letters where he gives us three assignments for each act of chapter three, the clinic, the apartments, and the daycare. One of the things I found kind of suspect about Father Garcia is how easily he's gained access to the data that would give him the possible locations of the twins, or even if the twins existed in the first place. The twins have nothing to do with Michael's story, with Father Garcia's story, with even Malthus in a way. If he has access to all this data, like foster care data, the data that led him to the tip of the New Haven apartments and the daycare, then surely he can find death certificates for Nate and Jason. But that leads to the question, are miscarriages given death certificates in the traditional fashion? And I'm of the mind that Nate and Jason's death was due to cult meddling. So if the second death cult had a hand in Nate and Jason's miscarriage, then of course they're going to scrub any record of the miscarriage from the record. If I wanted to go even further in arguing secret ulterior motives to Father Garcia, I would point out the fact that in every act of chapter three, he's making us do all the heavy lifting while he's conveniently found himself predisposed and too busy to do said investigation. But then I would argue it's a video game. We're the player. We want to be doing the heavy lifting. So as interesting as it would be to ponder on possible negative or evil ulterior motives to Father Garcia, I just think there's all these fingers pointing to him being a good guy, or at least on the side of good. Anyways, while the profane Sabbath is at hand and we are busy in Gary land, Father Garcia is likely blasting his way through Gary's forces, following behind us, his job being made a lot easier because of Father Ward's thrall frenzy, where he kills a significant portion of Gary's mortal army. Eventually, Father Garcia catches up to us, just as Gary is about to attack us, 
and he blasts him in the face. Gary slinks away into the crucible and Father Garcia tells us that it's up to us to jump into the crucible and finish this once and for all. We follow Gary into the crucible and Father Garcia helps by blasting away cultists and thralls while we take care of Super Miriam. Regardless of our choice as to who we team up with in the end of the game, Lisa or Father Garcia, Father Garcia likely spends the rest of his life fighting the unspeakable either until it leads to his demise, or perhaps he goes through a similar redemptive arc that Father Ward went through. Going into this, I had some questions. Why is he obsessed with Malthus? Who possessed Michael? What could the clown nose mean? And is Father Garcia good or evil? But now, after completing the game and completing all of this analysis, I think I'm pretty stalwart in my answers to those questions. I think the reason why Father Garcia is obsessed with Malthus is because he blames Malthus for being the prime principality of Michael's affliction. This doesn't necessarily mean that Malthus is the one possessing Michael. So we don't know what lesser demon or specific demon is afflicting Michael. In my opinion, I think it has something to do with that clown nose. Now, Malthus doesn't have anything to do with clowns, so that's why I would say that it has to be some sort of lesser or separate demon or principality that's afflicting Michael, not Malthus. And the final question, is Father Garcia good or evil? My final appraisal of Father Garcia is that he is on the side of good. We don't know enough about him to say he is a benevolent person, a good guy, but he certainly is a formidable antagonist to the forces of evil. And the enemy of my enemy is my friend. I just can't help but feel there is this sort of lack of responsibility, this sort of vainglory you can either interpret the way he throws Father Ward into these situations as him believing in Father Ward or him being so hell-bent on defeating the unspeakable that he's willing to do it by any means necessary. But like I said, we need people like Father Garcia in a world like this. So all in all, he filled a wonderful role in the game of faith, and he's a huge fan favorite. So let's move on to the antagonists of our game. Much like the three prongs to Gary's trident, there are three prongs to the Unspeakable's army. You have Gary's army of cultists and thralls, Miriam's army of demons, and Malthus's army of those purple acolytes. We don't know much about Malthus, only that he is an obsession of Father Garcia, beefed with Alu over the possession of Father Ward, and has these purple acolytes that walk backwards, donning maligned, deflated heads. All we know about his army are these acolytes. Before getting into Miriam, I wanna get into this demon theory I've got going on. For the sake of this theory, I'm classifying these lesser demons that belong under Miriam's army as the enemies that we fight with gray and black bodies and red heads or red accoutrements. So Jeffrey from the clinic, because of his fully red coloring, I would classify him under Gary's army and also He's not a demon, more of a maligned human, or perhaps a human hybrid. And yes, while Gary, Malthus, An and Alu are demons, they are higher demons, or, well, I guess lower <laughs> principalities, archdemons, if you will. Now, these lesser demons are summoned, they're conjured through the evils of the second death cult. And there are 10 of these lesser demons in the game. The cornfield demon is what I believe to be the reflection of Sister Miriam. Killing six orphans, it gives this omen and foretelling of Sister Miriam's kidnapping and ritualistic abuse of six orphans. It's also the only demon that has an upside down cross on its face. And the only other time we ever see anything with an upside down cross on its face is the statue in Garyland or beneath the daycare, La Pieta Corota. La Pieta Corota is depicting Sister Miriam. So we have that link. Sister Miriam being depicted with an upside down cross on her face and the upside down cross faced cornfield demon. They both killed six kids. That's pretty cut and dry. Speaking of the cornfield demon, let's go back to chapter two. You have three demons in chapter two associated with these three safe family tome cultists. The mist baby demon associated with the bald cultist, the graveyard maze associated with the sorcerer cultist or scruffy cultist, and the umbilical cord demon associated with the mourning mother cultist. Each of these demons is a reflection of their associated cultist, which would make sense that the fourth demon we face, which isn't really a boss battle, just a little cutscene, is 
the reflection of Father Ward, the evil reflection of Father Ward in the mirror. And what demon is heavily associated with mirrors? That's right, the mirror demon. So, with the cornfield demon, mist baby demon, graveyard maze be demon, and the umbilical demon all accounted for, that leaves six demons, including the mirror demon. You see where I'm going with this? Six orphans, six demons. And remember, among those six orphans is Lisa. So, if the mirror demon is associated with Father Ward, then who is Lisa's demon? We do meet Lisa in the apartments, just as we finally defeat the peekaboo demon in the apartments, but thematically it just doesn't make any sense. A lot of the things the peekaboo demon says are actually more applied to Father Ward. Perhaps the mirror demon isn't exclusively for Father Ward. Maybe the reason Lisa hasn't interacted with the mirror demon, as far as we know, is because, well, one, Gary has other reasons to have Lisa alive. He wants Lisa for sacrifice. So it would make sense that all of these demons would follow Miriam's lead, which she's following Gary's lead. And also, all the mirrors in the apartments are shattered. So even if the mirror demon wanted access to Lisa, he wouldn't be able to. Remember that detail? That would make sense as to why all of these demons, every single one of them, wants to kill Father Ward. You see, the second death wants Lisa alive, but the second death wants Father Ward to die, because Father Ward is a liability if kept alive. After all, it is Father Ward that thwarts the profane Sabbath. So even though my demon shadow theory is kind of flimsy, I do still find it pretty fascinating that we do have this clear parallelism. Perhaps these specific demons, these six demons, the Mirror, Pentarock, Spindly, Chalice, Basement, and Peekaboo Demon, were all summoned from whatever Sister Miriam did to these six orphans underneath Snake Meadow Hill Church, using the sacrificial currency of six innocent souls gets you six powerful demons. So Sister Miriam's army is made of demons she has been summoning over the years. Hence is why she's called Mother of Demons. In the 30s, Miriam went through the second death ritual. And after several days of sacrifices, Gary emerged from her wound. Whether this was her first summoning or not, I'm not sure. But at some point, a demon, one I believe she summoned, the cornfield demon, devours six orphans at the Snake Meadow Hill Church. This places the orphanage in a state of desperation. Shortly after, Sister Miriam comes along to restore it, only to kidnap six of the additional orphans that followed after her hiring, killing four of them and leaving Lisa and Father Ward, or I should say John Ward as an orphan, to walk the world as husks. If my demon theory is correct, then that means that the six orphans she kidnapped, four being sacrificed, two being maligned, led to the creation of six demons, including the peekaboo demon and the mirror demon. At some point, Sister Miriam takes it upon herself to act as all three persons of the unholy trinity. But because her body was old and likely heavily taxed from the many years of summoning demons through her second death wound, her body was utterly obliterated. Thus, her body hung in perpetuity in the crucible. Her power primarily being felt through the lesser demons like the peekaboo demon and her effect on Father Ward's dreams. Gary's army, on the other hand, is made of red-colored thralls, cultists, and mutants. His confirmed assets are the fertility clinic, the New Haven apartment bu building, and the daycare. His clinic serves the purpose of a source of babies to kidnap and use in the second death ritual, passing them through the second death wound into a portal to hell. Also in the clinic, he's prototyping his thralification drug and I would even argue some early prototyping of the Plagueis cultists, or at least mutagenic experiments with Jeffrey. In Jeffrey's case, he would be a sort of prenatal mutation, whereas cultists are sort of late in stage human to non-human mutations. His apartments serve the purpose as the perfect recruitment ground for thralls and cultists, and also a source from the tenants uh, of sacrifices. And finally, the daycare acts as a front for the dungeons beneath. What's very interesting is that even in our world, we had 
sort of satanic panic conspiracies regarding things like clinics, like abortion clinics, and daycares. And although I don't know of any specific satanic panic stuff regarding apartment buildings, I mean, who doesn't think their landlord is the Antichrist? Anyways, the dungeon beneath serves the purpose of experimentation on the cultists, but also the dungeons serve as the protective shell for the crucible, where Gary, Miriam, and Malthus reside. Gary sought to replace Sister Miriam's role as the unholy trinity through Amy Martin, who was recruited by Gary through the clinic. But Father Ward's meddling in chapter one prevented that from happening, placing Amy in a severely weakened state, not dissimilar to the state that Sister Miriam was in. So Gary's last option is for the unholy trinity to be decentralized across three separate entities, the mother in the clinic, the daughter being Tiffany in the apartments and the unholy spirit underneath the daycare. He is prophetically defeated by Father Ward and Father Garcia in a duel, but before being finished off, slinks away into the crucible. All three heads of the Unspeakable's army, Gary, Miriam, and Malthus, merge into one Sister Miriam, which is where we discover Gary's true name being Astaroth. Father Ward defeats Super Miriam, Saint Sister Miriam explodes into a bloody mess, Malthus disintegrates, and Gary is left alone where he eventually gets gobbled up by the unspeakable from within Amy's second death wound. And Father Ward shortly after exercises Amy once and for all. Now that's Amy's happy ending, but what about her troubled beginnings? We will start off with a cursory view of the Martin family's history and then go into a more detailed timeline specifically of Amy. The earliest event that's relevant to our story is when Cindy miscarries Nate and Jason. I'm of the mind that this is of cult meddling. I mean, you know, it's kind of like Chekhov's miscarriage, you know? Why have a miscarriage if you're not going to have it relevant to the story's overarching evil plot? And besides, it primes her and overall the family for cult meddling, putting them in a vulnerable state. However, Cindy is in a particular vulnerable state, especially when Bob is stationed in Nicaragua with his colleague Morris, the guy who writes that letter at the end of the bad ending. Amy is alone with her mother and chooses to pass the time with volunteer work at the clinic. While Gary is grooming Amy into his motives, Cindy is further despairing, finding mutilated animals in the forest noticing strange people wandering around the forest and around their house. She's hearing voices around the house and outside the house. She's creating birthday invitations for the birthdays of her deceased twins. She's creating drawings as if the twins are drawing them. And at some point, Bob sends a doll home. Specifically, he sends the doll home for Amy. But Cindy takes a particular interest in it going so far as to ask a random woman at a book club if she knows anything about it. Bob eventually makes his way back home from Nicaragua, but it seems as if Cindy's delusions aren't getting any better. Morris specifically mentions Cindy's obsession with wanting to create replacements for Nate and Jason, similar to the practices he and Bob witnessed in Nicaragua. That's why I create this link between that doll that was sent home and this new obsession with finding replacements. Perhaps it's some sort of, uh, I think it's called a fetish, I think it's called, or a, uh, uh, like a voodoo doll, but I think that's a, a bit of a different, the voodoo doll's a little bit different. An effigy kind of thing. Oh, um, an empty vessel. Oh, shoot. Like, that's like the huge, that's like a theme in this whole freaking game. Oh, shoot, it's like an empty vessel, bro. Fill it up with some wine, bro. <laughs> in addition, Amy is showing troubling behavior, enough so that she, their par her parents bar her from doing any more volunteer work at the clinic. And they ascribe the help of Father Allred to do a sort of diagnosis of Amy Martin. What's very interesting is that in a note that we find in chapter two, right before you fight the umbilical cord demon, it even states that Bob Martin and Cindy Martin were not religious parents. So it is kind of interesting that they would seek the help of Father Allred. And I've also seen some people interpret the reason why Amy was barred from working at the clinic was because of having hyper-religious parents. But I don't know, again, well, for number one, we get a confirmation that they're not hyper-religious. And number two, they would have, if that was the case, they would have barred her immediately because there's no 
hiding the fact that it was a fertility and abortion clinic. They must have sensed something was changing her and they surmised that it was had something to do with the clinic, which they were correct. So Father Allred makes his first visit and then shortly after makes his second visit with Father Ward. Father Ward and Father Allred do their first exorcism of Amy Martin. And what follows is both the parents being strangled to death by their innards and the corpse of Father Allred being used to torment Father Ward. What goes on is a night of torment, the demon possessing Amy, playing with its food, its final morsel being the holy man. Because of reasons we'll get into in Father Ward's final whiteboard, Father Ward ends up escaping into the arms of law enforcement and the ambulance. Amy and Father Ward are taken to the Yale Psychiatric Institute, where Father Ward appeals his way out and Amy escapes. I would imagine with the help of the second death cult. At some point, Gary puts her through the second death ritual. And remember, Tiffany says she's the first to have done it willingly. Her face is carved off and mutilated, creating this bloody portal to hell, which is used to evidently pass newborns through to complete the second death ritual. This is why we see blood, gore, and demonic symbols in the basement of the Martin family household. That is where she went through the second death. It is the site of at least the first part of her failed exorcism. This keeps going on for at least about a year until Father Ward returns in chapter one to finish what he started. This exorcism is a bittersweet success. So Father Ward exercises Amy. She jumps out the attic window. That's the kind of almost a death rattle. One last impulse from the possessing demon to make her jump out of the window. And I'm of the mind that it's actually Amy, her unpossessed self, probably dumbfounded from her situation with this brutal, brutal mangled face crawling, you know, to, to in this forest. And for some reason at this point, Father Ward only has one option, and that's shoot, that's it. Shoot Amy, shoot Father Garcia, shoot Mirror, or shoot Michael. Not like carry, uh, not carry Amy to the police or anything, I don't know. So he flees, and I think this is out of his own cowardice and his own dumbfoundment. This is chapter one, after all. This is very early into his character development. Anyways, with Amy there in the forest, basically bleeding out, the cult, including Gary, go looking for her because mind you, they were holding her up in the basement committing the second death ritual. So at some point they must have evidently found the basement empty and went out looking for her, or at least maybe just bumped into her, found her in the forest, which is where she is whisked away into the crucible. But before we go any further, the reason why we know the cult is out there looking for her or seeking her is because in the bad ending, of, or I guess one of the bad endings of chapter one, if you shoot the fox, which is one of the ritualistic sacrifices of the second death cult, this distracts them from looking from, for Amy and they intercept you on the road. So they were already en route to the Martin household, perhaps with a fresh batch of sacrifices, but when they found you tampering with their ritual out of revenge, they wanted to come and give you a piece of their mind. So that's how we know that the, re the, the red-robed people and Gary and the second death cult were en route to Amy. So anyways, she is whisked away and she's kept for safekeeping under the crucible, similarly to Sister Miriam. However, from there, she communicates through us through our dreams in chapter two and chapter three, and through two notes she leaves behind, perhaps while she's being dragged or perhaps while she's being taken to the crucible specifically in chapter three. So she's in our dreams in chapter two and three, and she gives us two notes written in purple in chapter three, specifically the one that you find in the daycare and the one that you find at the bottom of the stairs when you enter Moloch's navel. These two notes are helpful to Father Ward. They're not taunting in any way. They're not mean spirit in any way. It's for real Amy telling us, number one, how to get past the daycare and find Gary, and number two, how to defeat Super Miriam. Speaking of which, Fast forward to when Father Ward defeats Super Miriam after Miriam obliterates, Malthus dissipates, and Gary is left there in his sort of bearded form. Amy Martin floats down, and when Gary's about to embrace her as Mea Trinitas Profana, the unspeakable, angrily, 
emerges, or I should say some appendage that probably represents the unspeakable, comes out of Amy and grabs Gary and pulls him into hell. Mind you, this isn't him being gobbled up by Amy, okay? This is a portal to hell, not a maw. <laughs> with Gary defeated, with Malthus and Miriam defeated, the unspeakable makes a retreat. This effect has a for real physical effect on Amy. This is the first time we ever see her second death wound be reversed. Part of me wonders if in a minor way, Gary has been like Damnatio memoried. I mean, there is a little bit, right? Because when Amy, the arm comes out, it's like failure. And then when in the bad ending, it's like unforgivable, you know? So, but I don't think so because we still know about Gary. We still, so I don't think he's like, traditionally, you know, Damnasium Memori, but there is that, you know, faith is like poetry, it tends to rhyme. And so what we have is the tearjerker moment of the finale, of the game. Lisa tells Father Ward to finish what he started. She is now fully in her mortal form and is able to be cleansed by the exorcism. And Father Ward says, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Amen. That is actually the completion of the, of, of the exorcism. So, gosh, I'm all over the place. But uh, that was the last thing he needed to say before the initial exorcism was interrupted. And thus, what leaves, what's left behind are bones and remains. And we see Amy give up the ghost where we can only assume she spends the rest of eternity with her twin brothers and her mom and dad. Or is she with her mom? <laughs> no, I probably, mean, yeah, I mean, definitely. But I wanted to draw some attention to Cindy. Cindy is one of the most enigmatic characters of this game. Like, I want to know more about her even more than I want to know about Father Garcia. We've got a good uh, opening and closing to his story. We've got the biggest tease of just all these weird peripheral details surrounding Cindy. And it's just like, I, I want to know more about her. She claims that the mutilated deer was being played with by the twins, but the twins are dead. So was she playing with the mutilated thing of the deer? You know, it's easy for us to blame the deer on the second death cult, but perhaps she's the one who killed the deer. Perhaps it's some strange witch rule to create these replacements of her sons. We've got the creepy apparition of her in the dreams. We have those mannequins. We have the doll. We have those strange drawings, the mutilated deer. We have so many questions and details. We know that she performs the occult. We know that at least in some subconscious way, she's aware of the second death cult. We have her creepy apparition and the most damning thing, and granted she did share this blame, blame with Bob, but she and Bob interrupt the exorcism. I don't, I, you know, I don't think it's as easy as, oh, if only she didn't interrupt it, Amy would be totally fine. I don't think it's that simple, but she does interrupt the exorcism right before Father Ward is about to complete the, the, you know, the rites of exorcism. There is a mention in chapter two, a note that was written by that distraught minister who after collecting all the remains of the orphans that were killed by the cornfield demon, she promises she doesn't wanna see anyone in that sanctuary again. And she says, not even that girl that stayed inside last night. Chances are this character is just an, a character that hadn't been created yet. Perhaps Eridorf wanted to open up that route, but ended up deciding to go a different route. However, if the identification of this girl is a character that exists already in the storyline, I think it can only be two. The only two people who are old enough be present in that time of the first batch of orphans would have to be either Cindy or Sister Miriam. And because we know Sister Miriam had already been doing her shenanigans in the 1930s, and granted, we do not know when the cornfield incident happened, but again, going into my theory, I think Sister Miriam precedes, like, and it was like already active in the cult even during the cornfield shenanigans. So that leaves Cindy to be the prime suspect, in my opinion, for the girl that stayed inside at night. This could possibly explain her brutal sensitivity to the occult and all of these crazy things happening. 
and would explain why her abode would be predestined to be on the same street as the Snake Meadow Hill Church. This is flimsy conjecture. I think it's more likely, again, this was just an un unimplemented character, but it's fun to think about Cindy being involved in the story so early on. It's a really cool thing to think about because there's just so many details around her. There's a picture, but it's so, so blurry. Cindy is at the top of the list of characters I want more information on. More than Sister Miriam, more than Gary, more than Father Garcia, even more than Michael Davies. I want to know more about Cindy, honestly. But we cannot finish off this story without acknowledging the man who finished what he started, Father Ward. And so we end with Father Ward, the main protagonist of Faith the Unholy Trinity. Think back to Dream 3 for a moment. Possessed Amy is mocking Father Ward for failing to save his mother, Meredith. She's referring to Meredith Ward, Father Ward's mother's passing, which left Father Ward to be left at an orphanage in the care of the Snake Meadow Hill Orphanage, specifically in the care of Sister Miriam. He makes friends with Lisa, a fellow orphan, but they are soon whisked away by Sister Miriam, along with four other orphans. Those four orphans were executed in a ritual, and Ward and Lisa were left as husks. Perhaps acting as sleeper assets for the second death cult? At some point, Father Ward becomes an ordained priest, and fast forward to September 1986, where Father Allred conscripts the help of Father Ward in the help of the exorcism of Amy Martin. They arrive to the Martin household, and this is the point where Father Ward meets Cindy and Bob Martin for the first time. Note that in all of our recollections of our flashback dreams, we never see Cindy talk once. Bob and Cindy walk us to the kitchen and to the basement entrance, and informs us that he had to restrain Lisa. Father Allred assures him that God's servants are at work here. Bob and Cindy escort Ward and Allred to the entrance of the basement, and Bob informs the servants of God that he had to restrain Amy in the basement. Remember, this is against Father Allred's advice. Father Allred wanted to have the exorcism take place at the shed outside of the Martin household, away from the Martin family. This takes us to Dream 2, where we're starting the exorcism of Amy Martin. Father Ward recites the rite of exorcism while Father Allred presses the spacebar. Suddenly, Cindy and Bob interrupt the exorcism, and Amy calls out for her mother, afflicting Cindy. Father Ward takes the family up to the kitchen, then returns back to find Father Allred incapacitated. With Amy nowhere to be found, she must have snuck past us perhaps through the boxes that split the bottom part of the basement, or she teleported. Father Ward grabs Father Allred's cross, turns around, and makes his way up into the house. He sees creepy apparitions of Cindy. He finds the glasses of Bob left in the master bedroom, right in front of a mirror where he can see an apparition of Bob's ghost behind him. Father Ward makes his way to the attic and has his first standoff with Amy Martin. This is where she mocks his dwindling faith, mocks the ineffectiveness of that little stick or the crucifix, and even mocks his dead mom. His fear prevails and he flees the standoff against Amy, using the mannequins in the preceding attic room to barricade himself from her. He finds the mangled corpse of Cindy Martin in Amy's room, the mangled corpse of Bob Martin in his room. Father Ward makes his way into the kitchen and hears the cries of Father Allred to come and save him and help him. He heeds Father Allred's call just to find Amy using Father Allred's corpse as a puppet. What commences is a night of torment. But Father Ward escapes by calling to his guardian angel. The guardian angel heeds his call and allows him to leave this foul place. He is whisked away alongside Amy to the Psychiatric Institute of Yale. As we've already established, Father Ward appeals his way out of the Psychiatric Institute and behind the scenes, at some point at least, Amy is whisked away, likely by the cult. Fast forward a year from the initial exorcism, September 1987, Father Ward returns to the Martin household to finish what he started. For some reason, he knows that Amy is going to be there, likely through one of his many, many nightmares. He exercises Amy and once again flees. What commences is an onslaught of nightmares, prophetic reconstructions of his suppressed memories of his childhood. And it's through these nightmares that Amy, the twins, and the unspeakable, and perhaps possibly Father Garcia, communicate to him, 
to keep him going. And with the help of this reconstruction or real intercession of Father Garcia, he survives the night. Taking us to chapter three, Father Ward receives three assignments from Father Garcia. He defeats Jeffrey and the mother of the unholy trinity in the clinic. He defeats Alu, the peekaboo demon, and Tiffany, the daughter of the unholy trinity, in the apartments. And finally defeats the unholy spirit and mirror demon underneath the daycare. What follows is his delving into Garyland, the forbidden forest. And finally, the crucible, where he faces off with Super Miriam. With the help of intel that was given to Father Ward from Amy, through notes left for him in chapter three, he lights himself on fire and transfers that fire onto Super Miriam, much similarly to the way that this fire is transferred to the Scarecrow. I am thinking that all of these orphans, all of these souls that were hurt by Sister Miriam are gathering around celebrating the defeat of this scarecrow, the defeat of Sister Miriam. This is not a ritual or a evil thing. This is a foreshadowing of, of triumph over a truly evil amalgamation of three heads of the profane Sabbath, or sorry, second death cult. Covered in the blood of Super Miriam, he exercises once and for all Amy Martin and is escorted out by Father Garcia where we get to choose one of two endings. Either spend the rest of our lives fighting demons with Father Garcia or settle down and live a life of well-deserved peace with Lisa. My favorite is the Lisa ending, but I know a lot of you love the Father Garcia ending. And so completes the story of Father Ward and Faith the Unholy Trinity. Faith the Unholy Trinity has sealed itself as my favorite horror video game of all time. It's simple, it's dense, it's impactful. And Erdorf has single-handedly made me a New Blood fan. So all the money that I throw at New Blood and all of their indie games, you have Erdorf to thank for that. I want to go back to what I said at the beginning of this series. This is a story about how the humility that can come from cowardice can lead to a very profound bravery. Human beings are complex like this. Our flaws lead us to our strengths. And many times our strengths also lead us to our flaws. And it's easy to split Father Ward either as a coward or a hero. But in my opinion, we should look at him for his full journey, the full human that crossed that Rubicon to bravery while still holding that fear, those complex emotions still in his heart. Fox, it's time. I hear you, Peacock. Ladies, gentlemen, and everybody in between, it's time for us to go. It's time for us to go, but don't worry, we're not going anywhere. I think what he means is that you won't miss us. We'll be right here, but in a way I think we've always meant to be. four videos into this channel, and I'm already super proud of what we've accomplished here. The amount of work and love that I've poured into these videos is something I know for a fact I wouldn't have been capable of three months ago. Since my youth, I've always been a pretty creative person, and throughout my entire adult life, I've always been a very hardworking person, and yet it always seemed like those two worlds were constantly at war with each other. But that the sheer force of that indescribable love that you have all shown me in these past weeks and past month has 
force these two worlds to come together and it's my hope that I can take what has happened here, happened in my life, and pay, pay it forward, pay it back by continuing to pour my love and hard work into these things. And, and it continues to make your lives happier and your mornings and your routines all the more enjoyable. Seriously, thank you. I won't keep you any longer. Ma salama, su desertune, hasta luego, I'll see you soon.